How you doing? Good evening. This poor little part of the world is being washed away, man. I was watching CNN before I came down here. You guys are in for a world of shit. <laughs> it's coming. Which makes me think, what the fuck is with people when, they, uh, when their town has been flooded massively for the 50th time? <laughs> like down south, there's you know, parts of the Delta or wherever. Heavy rains have floated away 900 people. You know, we found this man under like two tons of silt. You know, a man's station wagon is found 30 miles down, you know, river that used to be Main Street. And then the water goes away and they build the city again. <laughs> or those people who build their homes along the beach. If you go up from LA, up the coastline, they have those really rickety homes. Or on the East Coast, same thing. Big ass storms come in, blow these houses down, and these, you know, to, to live on, you know, this part of the, the world, you know, this really nice property, these people are really rich. So you figure they gotta have some brains to get some dough out of the American system, right? And so they're standing there going, I don't know why, why? Maybe God hates us, I don't know. We lost everything, you stupid fuck. What were you thinking? <laughs> And it's incredible to me when people get like mad at the weather. Like they try and like, we'll build a levee, we'll do this. You fuck, move. <laughs> you know, well, Mother Nature doesn't, mother, why are you so stupid year after year? You move, <laughs> you move, ah! <laughs> burns, it breaks apart and sucks highways down into, you know, into crevices, you know, where the dark, where light of day will never see again. And they just, oh, well, well, let's put a Band-Aid on it and sky, sky. I was staying in San Francisco last night, you know, earthquake or Rama. And I'm, I was in this hotel, 32 floors up. I'm thinking, fuck, I'm looking out of this window, this beautiful skyline. Everything around me is 30 or floors, 30 floors or higher around me. I'm, God damn, what if this whole shit just went? <laughs> I don't know. I was thinking, uh, as the gentleman was reading... Uh, the, uh, the gigs you guys have coming up. Man, Grassy Knoll, I got that first record. It's pretty cool, but it made me think of not so much the band, but last year in February, I played in uh, Dallas. I did a talking show there. And um, the hotel I was staying at was two blocks away from the Grassy Knoll. In fact, the, you look out the lobby of the hotel and you look right at the grassy knoll and the book depository where JFK got taken out. And so after the show, me and the road manager hiked up there to, to check it out. I mean, it's this intense uh, landmark. And um, it was about 1.30 in the morning. We went up there and it looks the same as it did in, in the movie. And... Um, <laughs> It's, it's intense because uh, you've seen that footage so many times, the uh, Zapruder films, and uh, the intersection has not changed a great deal. It's, it's intense because uh, you've seen that footage so many times, the uh, Zapruder films, and uh, the intersection has not changed a great deal. And so we're walking around, we're sitting on the grassy knoll and looking up at the building, looking around and going, whoa, this is a serious little corner of history here. And rustling around us were these really intense guys just running around and, and just kind of just acting very furtively, like. And I'm thinking, ah, must be like gay rendezvous place. <laughs> For like really straight looking gay guys who can't make like the club and bar scene. And you know, guys who look like they're like insurance salesmen, they look totally like, you know, just like really corporate but you know so they hide their their gayness really under the vest, you know, and and they maybe their the parking lot was like a, a hangout place. So I'm just like, hey Rick, man, maybe this is like a, a hookup place here, you know, because I've seen I've seen places like that. There's places a lot of places in Washington D.C. where I grew up like that, where you know guys w w could meet each other and it was not a club thing. It's like they could, you know, you'd be there with your newspaper, up just reading the paper at three in the morning. You see see the other man, distinguished gentleman in his fifties, and kind of like. See you in the stall down the way. And, you know, they would, you know, <laughs> conduct, their, conduct their business, which is, you know, you know whatever. But um, I was looking at these guys. I'm going, okay, it's, it's, it's all about that until 
all these guys, I'm starting to notice, they all have their notepads, and they're all going up to the window where the, the supposed gun was fired. And they're like, they're, they're like cons it's conspiracy boy, one through ten. These like ten conspiracy boys at like 1.30 in the morning, like, well, I don't know, I think it came from there. No way. <laughs> I'm like, oh, fuck. Which always leads me to believe that people... People just must be generally nuts. I mean, there must be a, just a large slice of Americana who's insane all the time. Because, or at least, at least the female half of it. And here's my reasoning for this. Be before, no, no, no okay. Uh, take it easy. I'll, I'll prove my point in a moment. Um, or I'll, I'll, uh, I'll state my case in a moment, okay. Uh, but before that, uh, Mr. Soundman, if you have uh, that CD or whatever it was you were playing, uh, it's coming through my monitor. And it, the music is nice, but it's a bit distracting. Or maybe it's some kind of radio wave that we're picking up. Whatever it is, if you can kill it, I'd appreciate it. Okay, well, this is, this is why I, I, I wonder about you women. Because I, I know, I know that women are smarter than men. I know... What are you clapping? I didn't say I was happy about it. I just said I think you all are. You don't see me jumping up and down for fucking joy about this situation. I wish it would be. I wish it was temporary, but it's not. It's it's gonna be that way for so many lifetimes. It's like because women are like, mm, no, and men are like, please, please, please. Oh, you know, this is typical. You know, and I'm one of them. You know, P pathetic. You know, but. Seeing guys like this, like some of the most boring men on the planet, and having been dissed and ridiculed by like men with their power books, with their spreadsheets, you know, at airports, I, I always encounter men with their laptops open, with spreadsheets, crunching numbers, talking about the, like, the business they've been doing. And there's the driest, most boringest business that they're up to. And... I sat next to two men who were selling, I guess they're carpet salesmen. They were talking about a sale of carpet they had just made in the Midwest. And every few moments, they would punctuate their conversation with a high five. Like, you know, we, oh man, we kicked some major ass with that two inch ply. And they're talking about like, what's, like what makes their computers go, I got that 603E microprocessor ship. This thing just will, this thing will fuck the taste out of your mouth, Jim. <laughs> Oh, yeah, well, this will fucking blow so much dirt up your ass, and, you know. And I'm listening to these guys, I'm like, wow, how boring are these two guys? And I notice one thing they have in common besides the laptop and their descriptions of the laptop as, as if these laptops were like an extension of God's almighty dick. They both have wedding bands on. And this is my thing. What, I wonder what is up with women. What do you find attractive about these guys? And if women are so smart, which I think they are, and they're very strong, and they're very tough, they see a lot of blood, they go through a lot of pain to get everyone on the planet, you know, they, they, they shit watermelons on your behalf, on all our behalves, and we thank you for that. But w one of you, s someone with a vagina on this planet, or probably a few, some, some of these women fucked Mark Furman. It certainly was not me. Don't you, don't you understand that you women could like turn the whole world around by withholding? You know, the, the, the racist, goose-stepping, shithead, peckerwood cop, if he couldn't get any, we could like, we could breed him out of the gene pool. I was just thinking like, who fucks these people? And, and I would like to get all the women in the world lined up in, in like, you know, nine or ten stadiums and just get on that massive PA. Hands up! Who fucked Mark Furman? Who's been fucking Daryl Gates? You know, who's been fucking all the Klan guys? Who's fucking the white power skinhead guys? Who is it? Get her! Come here! What the fuck were you thinking? You know, and just, 
give him some shit and figure out what's going on in the mind of this person. So I'm thinking to myself in the airport as I'm listening to these two guys talk about carpet sales, spreadsheets, and the power of their almighty computer. I don't care that they like to sell carpet and have computers. If you want to do that, more power to you. It's when they start giving me shit is when I have a problem. I hear them amongst themselves. Look at that guy with the tattoos. <laughs> I guess the circus is in town. <laughs> Smack. <laughs> and this, it's then I notice the wedding bands, and I just try and imagine what sex is like with these men. How, like, the man comes home from the jungle, the jungle of carpet. You know, he comes home, you know, well shaven, you know, chafed around the neck from shaving every day, strangled by the tie, laptop around his shoulder. Honey, I'm home. And, you know, you know they fall on the bed, and I, th I think it would be why they made the remote. So as the woman's like, yes, yeah, oh, I'm so glad about the bowling alley, dude. Yes, yes, yeah, high five, you know, you're fucking me. <laughs> the remote is, you know, tucked under the pillow, like Larry King, Nightline, cool, uh, whatever, uh -huh. yes, yes, oh yes, you're the man, dear, uh-huh, okay. And he's like, well, dear, you know, we really cooked some ass there. <laughs> Look, sorry, dear, I gotta go. I can't, uh, I can't be home tonight. I gotta go out and check out the grassy knoll. And uh, I'm gonna, you know, me and the guys, we're gonna go out there and we're gonna figure this thing out. We're gonna get to the bottom of it. It just blows me away. I guess it's, it's that women are so wonderful that they have this capacity that they can love these people too. I guess, I guess that's why I'm so enamored with you because you have this great strength that you can take in these Oh, guys, in my little Nietzschean fantasy jungle, these guys, would we'd only breed them to make soup bowls out of their heads. <laughs> the coming attractions to this venue, Dio. <laughs> God, are, can you, could you bear to miss it? I had tickets for him for his L.A. show, but I'm going to be out of town, man. I so much, because now that he's back to the club level, you know, the small theater level, how awesome would it be to be able to stand in front of him and just like, yes. <laughs> I bought the new album, Angry Machines. I bought, I bought it the other day, and this girl I was with looked at me like, you're not buying that. I said, it's the only one I don't have. <laughs> I can't help it. I'm so into that guy. Just the righteous fury of this dude, and the stack heels, and the thunderous voice, and the ever-present, you know, song about the evil woman who lurks somewhere at the end of the rainbow, because she always does. Behind the dragon, ah, she lurks, look out, ah! So many times I have wanted to be that man just to have a voice that powerful and to say some of those silly things. Because I can't loosen myself up to say silly things in songs. Well, I don't consider them silly. I just could never sing about a dragon or something. <laughs> I've been um, recognizing this interesting human phenomenon lately, uh, and I wanted to share it with you. Maybe uh, it occurs to you too. I reckon, on the whole, people are, are pretty cool. You know, I, I try and get along with people as best I can. One time a guy once said to me, and when I went off on some bitter rant about how everyone should be destroyed, um, <laughs> well, you know, uh, well, okay, you've never felt like that, where you walk outside and, you know, and, and these people, you know everyone in the world is, is conspiring to ruin your day, and you just go like, fuck it, just kill them all, <laughs> and I'll just go, you know, go to the empty blockbuster, take some videos home, and, <laughs> because, they can frustrate you. You know, you can have a very bad human experience, you know, when someone is, you know, not cool. So sometimes you can uh, lose your temper with them and just, you know, go to the post office and, you know, whatever. You see why people lose their tops all the time after what you've been through, and you've all been through something that made you at least think of killing, you know. So I, I was going off on one of these. Let's, let's just go start shooting people. And, and he said, you know, Henry, as bad as it is, Everyone is doing the best they can. And usually that kind of sentiment just makes me want to like, grab a blunt object and, and, and like club this person like a baby seal. You know, I'm, yes, I'm doing the best I can to fucking kill you, kill you. 
And I kind of let that sink in. And, you know, it's kind of true. You know, he, he, you know the, the moron is doing the best he can. You know, this guy's doing the best he can because they're trying, to, they're trying to get over. And so I took that into mind. I'm like, okay, yeah. So I, I try and give people the benefit of the doubt. I think this thing that I've noticed, because I spend a lot of time in airports. I travel a lot, and I spend at least three days a week in airports when I'm, when I'm traveling. Uh, sometimes more. Sometimes seven days a week in airports. I, I have a lot of frequent flyer miles on United. I'm, like, catching up with Jay Leno now. And um, I, I don't even, I, I get put in business class just when I show up in, at the airport. They just put me in business class on a plane because I fly so much. I know people at airports now. Hey, Andrew, good to see you again I'm, as I'm power walking through Chicago O'Hare. One thing I've noticed that happens to people, uh, we are not good when we are mediocre. We are not good when we shoot below our potential. That's not when we get the best out of ourselves. When we have a mediocre aspiration, when we have a mediocre job that demands a mediocre ability from us, when we aspire to something that's kind of like the middle of the road, we don't get the great thing about us out. And when we are in a situation when we are treated stupid, as, as like we have no brains, like when you watch a movie that thoroughly insults your intelligence, like every single time the beautiful woman in the movie takes a shower, that camera goes right in with her. Okay, do I have a problem with naked women? No. <laughs> do, I, do I not, am I not too sure she's going to be naked in the shower? No, I'm, I'm pretty sure she's naked in the shower. Do I really need, do we really need to see her go take the shower? No. You know, do we see Bruce Willis taking many showers? Do we see him soaping his dick up? No. <laughs> Has Jean-Claude Van Damme ever waved his weenie in front of a camera? No. And I think it would be great if he did. Not that there'd be a whole bunch of women in a movie theater, like, watching Jean-Claude's flaccid dick wail, wiggle around and get off on it. They'd probably just be like, okay, you know. It would be great to watch the visceral and vocal displeasure of the male part of the audience. <laughs> like, oh, fuck! I mean, it'd be really vocal. God damn it, what the fuck is that? God, what the fuck? I mean, they'd be like fighting mad. You're making me watch a fucking dick? Man, I'm now 2% fag! What the fuck? So the guy goes like this, tell me when it's over. And then he figures out, tell me when it's over. That means she's watching it. Don't watch that. And so you're like half the theater in outrage, the other half in fear of getting their jaw broken. So it's like, and with the other half, until finally they hear a car engine start. Oh, it must be the chase scene. Thank God the dicks are away. But so when, you're, when your intelligence is insulted like that, we don't get what's great out of you. You know, you, when you are insulted and you have a mediocre job and you have a mediocre government that treats you like an idiot, you can become an idiot, right? So, there's this thing I've noticed that happens to people like you and me who are pretty sharp, right? I mean, you got your clothes on. Um, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm actually trying to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm being semi-serious here. Um, you have moral judgments. I, there is something in your mind where you go, that's right, that's wrong. You value your life as in you wouldn't jump in front of a speeding train. You'd go, no, that will kill me. I'm not doing that. You know, so you have a sense of right and wrong. You have a sense of survival, like you wouldn't go shoot yourself in the mouth before breakfast. You'd rather eat breakfast than shoot yourself in the mouth. You know how to make choices. So what happens to people when they get in a line? Have you noticed that when you stand in line with people, they immediately become very herd-like, very bovine, their mentality slows down, and all of a sudden, they don't know how to do anything. And you find that you are the only person in the entire line who knows what's going on, and you are trapped ahead of you and behind you. You are surrounded on two sides by idiots. You are trapped. This happens to me. I'm the only genius at the airport, it's, it, it, it would seem. I go into the airport, usually jet lagging, thoroughly exhausted, so my life becomes a dolly painting. I'm out of my mind. Like, 
walking in, uh, cool, air. You know, I'm just tripping from two days, four and a half hours of sleep. Go in the airport, insult number one. I'm standing in the line with a bunch of businessmen, you know, sharp guys, guys who have been living 40 plus years and haven't been killed yet. Guys who make enough money to have a big ass Rolex watch, who, who get paid. They must have something on the level here. How come they can't get through the metal detector without having it go off? They walk through the first time, eee, sir, could you please step back? You know what it says on the front of the metal detector? Like, big fucking metal detector. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a ho-ho direct, you know, detector. It's not an IQ detector. It's just going after metal. Pretty simple drill, this one is. Goes through, eee, sir, could you please step back? Uh, keys, change, uh, pocket watch, something, sir. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I had my keys in my pocket. Okay. Here's, here's where the insult comes in. I am now trapped behind this guy, shaving seconds off my life. To go through the metal detector, if you have your shit together, it takes what? About two seconds. When you don't have your shit together, it takes who knows how long. Okay, when you are trapped in a line with people who are acting like cattle, they are making you wait. When you wait, you put your life on pause. These people, okay, here's a totally hyper-paranoid, overreaching thought. They are depriving you of a few minutes of your time. They are basically slowly killing you. They are little mini murderers. They are lightweight assassins. Okay, so daily I'm being stalked and you know they try and kill me every day. Every day I go in, someone's trying to get me. And it starts within 30 feet of the front door of you know the departing flight thing. I get in the line, the guy goes through, comes back, can't remember to take his keys out. He pulls out of his pants the keys that would belong to about nine or 10 janitors, 17 pounds of metal on a ring. <laughs> Everyone goes, whoa, that's a lot of keys. Walks through again, you know, and he couldn't remember to take those out. This thing was like pulling his pelvis to the side. No, it wouldn't occur to me to take that fucking huge thing out of my pocket. No way. Walks through. Eee! And the, the, the two security people look at each other. This guy's an idiot. He has a plate in his head. What's going on with him? <laughs> Pulls back out again. Now we're now into the 40-second mark. Okay? We're now 38 seconds into my death here. Okay? And 38 seconds to me is, is an important piece of time. This is what I'm trying to get at. People do not value their time because... Too often, there's a lot of people who get insulted enough by enough innocuous television, enough innocuous culture, enough kind of lightweight education and stupid hatred that they devalue their own time. And they do not mind standing in long lines. There are people who will stand in line for four days to get tickets to the World Series. Four days. I'm going to wait so I can sit in a seat and watch a baseball game. Okay. Okay, man, I could never do that. I mean, if you're a fan, cool, but man, I think that this guy must not, either he really loves that game or he must not really like his life too much. So anyway, I'm dealing with people who hate their lives. The man ahead of me, A, he's trying to kill me, okay? B, he hates himself. So I'm dealing with a self-hating time waster who's murdering me with his time-wasting <laughs> self-hatred. Okay, now... He's taken 38 seconds of my life away. I feel like suing him right then and there, Ser serving him papers. <laughs> hey, yes? Well, th th this is a subpoena. That's right. You owe me 38 seconds off your life. I'll take, and I would be satisfied with the tip of your little finger, but I, I took so many tips off last year, I'm just bored. I want, I want, so I want 38 seconds of your life. I want, when the, when the angel of death comes, you know, fluttering over me, I want to go like, ha, <laughs> ha. Fuck, that's right, you got 38 seconds off that guy who couldn't get his shit together at the metal detector at LAX in 1997. I'll be back for you in 35, 34, 33, you know? So I wait a minute and a half for this guy to finally get 900 quarters out of the other pocket and uh, a, a collection of like odd uh, masonry nails out of like his ass. And finally we get through. The next, the next insult after standing in line with people who cannot figure out how to take out their air flight ticket and their, their photo ID so that they can go like, 
ka-chunk, okay, there you go. To stand in line with people who take seven minutes each to do that, I have now been murdered. For, um, two hours of my life have been ripped brutally away from me. The next insult is the moving sidewalk when I depart my flight. The moving sidewalk, maybe here in this part of the world, you do not have a moving sidewalk at your airport. Maybe uh, the Sacramento Regional Airport does not, uh, you know, the size of the airport does not necessitate a moving sidewalk, but all of you been to uh, bigger uh, you know, cities at, such as Chicago or wherever where you have a nine mile walk to baggage claim. They have a large moving belt of rubber that is called the moving sidewalk. You get on and you ambulate and it, uh, expediates your forward ambulatory progress towards baggage claim. It basically, you walk on it, you can just like really kick ass and track a whole lot of... Okay, why do people get on this thing and stand and look like weird cattle on their way, going down some weird conveyor belt on the way to the gaping jaws of death? And they just stand still like it's some weird parade. Like... E and they have that really bland, vacant look on their face. They're never on the moving sidewalk. <laughs> it's always... And what's going through their mind? Oatmeal. <laughs> Gray sky. Beige. <laughs> Off-white. Stamps. <sighs> and they'll stand still for nine minutes as they go down to baggage claim. Me, I get on the moving sidewalk. And if you time it just right, if you get the whole belt really pounding, you bounce down and spring forward with each step. So you actually start going bang, 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 and you can really get going. So I am moving down this thing. I power walk on there, so I'm basically walking at a slow wind sprint. I am jamming. I am efficient with my time. I am utilizing the moving sidewalk the airport has been so kind to give me. The ones they do not put in in the airport at Heathrow in England. You walk for six days. The last time I was there... I got off, and I'm like, oh, yeah, this, the long siege to, you know, immigration and baggage claim. And you walk. Well, not me. I power walk. Uh, by the time I get to immigration, I'm sweating. I've sweated through my sweatshirt. I'm carrying two backpacks. I'm out of breath, but I'm the first person in line. Have to be the first person in line. And the last time I got beat because Irvana Trump was in first class, and they had that fucking golf cart waiting for her. And she hopped on, and we had just done this 12-hour flight. Her hair was about this high over her head. It was perfect. She had, like, you know, the polished earrings, like the, the Rembrandt tooth bleaching system. <laughs> and I was out of my mind from fatigue, and I, when I'm out of my mind from no sleep, I, get, I do really, like, fucked up things that I would never do after, like, eight straight hours and three square meals. She goes driving away. I went running after the cart, <laughs> screaming, Ivana! Ivana! And she, <laughs> and I, I, I wasn't running as fast as the car was going. I was like having fun. And I thought she like, eh! But, but she, she was like. <laughs> and she just like powered like the nine mile drive to baggage claim. So anyway, I'm on the moving sidewalk making time. And the only thing that fucks with me is a human piece of cattle standing in the middle. If you're going to be a useless piece of shit, move to the right lane. You know, and I'm sure, I am dead sure that you all are just like me on this, efficient with your time, sharp, visionary, great jawline, tremendous ass. I'm sure all of you are just bounding down the moving sidewalk thinking, got to get the baggage claim, got to get out of here, got to get on to the next thing, do not want to waste my time living in an airport. Thank you. Thank you for the moving sidewalk. Watch me make efficient use of my time here on the planet because I don't get any of it back and I don't really have all that long and there's so much fucking stuff I want to do and I don't want to do it. You know, I don't want to waste my time here. I want to get going because what's awaiting me today is going to be awesome as soon as I get out there and get my teeth around it. So when you see someone in the way, you automatically have this hatred for this ass and the 
back of this head. You have contempt for this person, this time assassin, this slow murderer of your very existence. These people, you know, their, their senses are dulled from complacency. They're standing on a moving conveyor belt. I don't know why. And they're going. And, and they start feeling this bouncing sensation under their feet. And they go, oh, that's, ooh, that's very nice. It's kind of, oh, it's like a gentle massage. And then they feel a slight wind. Like, what's that? And the next thing they feel is a computer bag slamming into their arm and either a knee or a hip slamming into their leg as I hip check them into the boards. And the only thing they hear is, man, get the fuck out of my way. And the only thing they see when they get up is my taut, well-defined ass bounding towards baggage claim. So, I'm the first one at baggage claim. First one to wait the longest. You know, yeah, and that's a logic that just works itself out great, doesn't it? Ha, 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 ha. I mean, they haven't even turned it on yet. Like, baggage guy, they haven't even opened the plane, but I'm there. You know, got a good workout. I'm already sweating, but man, I made it first. I'm the first guy. Eight to ten minutes later, as the conveyor belt is slowly moving, as I've picked out the choicest spot to get my luggage, and I'm in a wide stance, staking out territory, like, you know, I'm right by the mouth of it, so I can, like, I'm out of there, time! You know, I want to be really efficient with my time. Eight to ten minutes later, all the people from the moving sidewalk start showing up to baggage claim, like, Old women helping their husbands. Ooh, uh, ooh. And I'm like, Pfft, you know, just looking at him right. Anyway, luggage comes out. I'm standing next to this guy. Blue Samsonite passes us, goes around. We look at it. Comes back around again. We look at it. <laughs> this is three minutes per lap now. Minute nine. Thing comes by again. The guy next to me goes, what was the other two times about? Getting in the mood? Getting your hand stretched? Just didn't feel like it? I smelled good? He just liked being around me? Maybe he can't even figure out what his luggage looks like? Unbelievable. So you can see how how negative I appear, okay? Of course, my luggage comes out last. <laughs> I'm the first there. I'm the last to leave. I stand alone. I stand alone next to a large, circular, black rubber oval that just goes around and around. My, finally, my backpack comes shooting out of the mouth of baggage claim, along with nine other pieces of luggage that have been going around and around with no one to pick them up. And I'm wondering, where are these people? Did they die on the flight? <laughs> Have they been put in some detention center? Are they writing, I will not waste Henry's time a hundred times on some blackboard furnished by United Airlines for the not-so-friendly part of the skies division? No, you know where they are? They're halfway home. Oh, God. <laughs> Get off the south direction, turn around, 10 north, go back to the airport. You know, can you imagine being, okay, <laughs> you married him. <laughs> you, what, what were you thinking? This guy's fucking you, okay? This, guy, this guy's going to get laid. Why? 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 <laughs> like I said, I get this agitation when I am exhausted, which is a lot of the time when the schedule is too insane. This thing happens to me when I get exhausted and I travel. I get very maudlin. You know, I get very emotional. You know how it is like when you haven't slept in like a day and a half. You just, everything is just like, oh, cut it out. Oh. Or you can watch a really corny movie like Fried Green Tomatoes, where if you have three square meals and eight straight hours of sleep, you watch and go like, okay, yeah, nice acting. Oh, here's the I'm supposed to cry part. Please. You know, okay, on like two days of no sleep, I watched it at like 4 in the morning because I didn't, I didn't want to sleep because so I had to go to the airport at like 5.30 anyway. I put it on. 
a bit after midnight. By the time the movie ended and, you know, what her na what's her name died, I was just like, oh, God, I rewound it again. Like, I want to see her alive one more time. You know, it's like pathetic. And the guy in the cab comes to pick me up. You've been crying? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, I have. And um, a few interesting experiences. Ma'am, this is not an interactive performance. <laughs> you notice I didn't say, shut the fuck up. <laughs> Sorry, dear. But, um... I thought he was very interesting. A bit coarse, but very interesting. Um, the last time I flew to England, I got there at like 8 in the morning, and I had meetings starting at like 11. So I went to this hotel figuring... I must consume protein. Protein will take place of sleep. So in a very surreal mood, I enter the breakfast room. I'm like, because I haven't slept for a long time and I'm jet lagging and I got meetings coming up and I got to be sharp. So I figure I will eat lots of eggs and get all that, you know, protein and all that cholesterol to keep, you know, you know, hard mind, hard arteries, thick blood. Yes. You know, it goes right along with that thick cranium. Awesome. So I go in there and I'm like shoveling, you know, this massive plate of eggs onto my plate. And I, 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 I'm eating the eggs and I sit down, you know, I'm eating, I'm eating. I look over at the table, two tables down from me. I see this guy, you might not know the name, his name is Dorian Yates. Dorian Yates has been Mr. Olympia for like four or five years or something. He's like numero uno male bodybuilder of the world. He's like five foot eight, nine, 250 pounds of like prime rib. If you had normal sleep and you passed and, you know, three square meals, if you were, like, rested and you walked by him, you'd be like, ah! <laughs> On no sleep, you just think someone put acid in your eggs. <laughs> I'm looking at him with a rapidly cooling fork of eggs in my forearm. I was like... <laughs> he lifts... A guy like this, a thing like this, does not eat, it feeds. You know what I mean? It is shoveling eggs into its mouth, into the food receptacle. It lifts the fork up. It goes like this. The arm looks like your thigh. It's like, Aah! it eats, it feeds, the plate is empty. It gets up to feed again. It went over to the egg bowl on this morning buffet, like, <laughs> turns around, puts the fork down, flexes its back, bread loaves come out of the back of its shirt, like, <laughs> everyone in the restaurant is like, whatever, I'm like, and all I want to do is just walk up like, don't hit me or anything, man, okay? Whoa. It was very weird, man. I tripped on it for the rest of the day because I was so tired. But a, a couple of flights ago in the uh, early fall, I was without sleep and I was flying and they put on that movie White Squall, which is not a bad movie, I guess. It's basically uh, Dead Poet Society on the sea. And it's, uh, you know, a teacher and a captain and a bunch of young boys. It's one of those coming-of-age films. It's very well shot. And uh, at the end of the movie, they encounter a white squall, which is a, this uh, paranormal occurrence in the sea where a big-ass wall of water comes and sees your boat and goes, ha here's where we go down. <laughs> and it like, kills the shit out of everybody, right? So the, here comes the white squall. Here comes the white squall. The white squall descends upon the boat. Students are being flung over the side. Help me, help me. They're like, you know, swimming around in the ocean, and the ship is sinking, and the ship's captain is looking for his wife. Uh, he finds her underneath. Uh, he can see her through a glass uh, door, a glass window uh, in the hold of the ship. She's been knocked out cold, and she has come to, and she's looking up at him, and she doesn't know what's going on because, like, something just rang her bells, and she just came to. So she's looking up at him with this look like, what's going on? You'll help me, right? And the guy can't get to her because the boat is going down. And he's trying to rip the door open, but he can't do it. And he's pounding on the glass trying to break it, but he can't do it. And he's screaming because he's losing his wife. And the boat's going down. She has no idea. She's, she's not even scared. She's like, 
what? What are you beating on the glass for? And she has this horrible look. She doesn't know. And he's like losing his shit. And the boat goes down. And he has to swim and go on a raft. And he's all, you know, distraught because he lost his wife. You know, if that happened to me, I'd just handcuff myself to the boat and go down. I couldn't live without her. You know, I'd be like, oh, oh God. You know? And so if I saw that normally, I'd sit in the theater and go, whoa, that's really bad. Oh, man. With no sleep and nine cups of coffee? <laughs> so, like, your emotions are caffeine-driven and, and insane from no sleep? I, have you ever seen anyone power cry where tears just projectile? <laughs> They like spurt from the from the face like <laughs> spring people in first class like <laughs> like oh, oh, <laughs> ah, oh my god oh my god and I was all wrapped up about it and the guy next to me was like what the fuck is your problem? Because like, he's already seen me piss my pants twice when we hit turbulence. A little jet of urine goes down there. So he's smelling my drying urine and now he's seeing me cry. You know? And we only have like seven more hours on the flight, you know? He's just glad I haven't tried to kiss him yet or anything. So, <laughs> about a month later, Thanksgiving happens. My managers are a husband and wife team, and they have Thanksgiving dinner. And they're inviting all their friends over, and, and they're of the age where they're, they and all their friends are having kids. So, the whole house is full of people and from the waist down, it's chaos. It's kids <laughs> destroying shit, as they will do. Tablecloth, coming with me. <laughs> kids keeping toys away from other kids. Other kids feeling the rejection of not being able to play with the toy. Go screaming and holding onto their mother's legs. I get dragged into this whole thing. Henry, come and have some turkey. I'm thinking, God damn, I, I bought 15% of their house, you know, management, 15% of my fucking flesh, 15% of my genius goes right to them. So if they say turkey, I'm like, fine, I'm coming over, I'm, t I'm taking three forks, I'm walking out with four rolls of toilet paper, I'm going to steal all kinds of shit. I always come out there like backing some major home appliance out the driveway so they don't see it. Is that our water cooler? What, man? See you later, 15. You know, I just like get out of there, I'm trying to get a little bit back, you know. So when they said come over for some free food, I'm like, thank, thank God for that. I'm going to come over and just like stock up for the winter. You know, I'll stick the drumsticks up my ass. I'm going out with some food. I'll just zip lock it and like stick it under my armpits, duct tape it on, like walk out, you know, mashed potatoes and Ziploc baggies all around me. I'm going home with at least three or four dinners worth. So I go over there, and the kids, I'm being introduced to all these kids, and they always have the same reaction to me. They're like, hey, 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 hey little kid, this is Henry. Hey. <laughs> and I, I, I'm such a, an egomaniac or whatever, I, I'm insulted that I'm being disrespected. By the, I'm like, hey, you can't talk to me? <laughs> hey, 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 hey. <laughs> I'm over here. The kid's burying his face into his mother's leg for all he's worth. He doesn't want to deal with me. And she's like, oh, he's just a little shy. I'm like, shy? You don't have to be shy of me. No one should be shy of me. What's, what's the matter with you? You're, t oh, you're too cool? <laughs> he can't be that cool. He still shits his pants. I mean, it's not the way to talk to a child. I, I, I'm not really ready for parenthood. So the mother has to like walk away like a peg leg with the child and, hanging on for dear life. So I'm meeting all these kids, and I'm, the, the, the whole house is becoming more quiet because these kids are turn to stone when they see me. They, they see the tattoos, and they're like... <laughs> and so I get introduced to uh, management's next-door neighbor who happens to be the lady from White Squall. It's uh, Caroline Goodall or whatever her name is. She was Schindler's wife in Schindler's List. Very good actor. So she comes over and Gail goes, hey, this is our next door neighbor. Blah, blah. I'm like, oh, how do you do? <laughs> You're the white squall chick. <laughs> and have you ever like hung out with like a full-time professional actor? They're really intense. Like every one of them I've ever met, none of them was a regular guy or girl who did some acting. They're just really acty. You know, they were like, oh, you must be an actor. It's like four years ago, I was in New York, we were making this record, and I was there for a little while, and um, I started going out with this actress. 
and she's really nice, really cool, all that. But she had that actress thing where she would start to like emote when we would hang out. I don't need like the emotional display when we're just, you know, you're at a restaurant eating dinner. I'm a low-key guy in public places. I'm just trying to keep quality. So I said, yeah, so where were you last weekend? Oh, I, I went and I visited my father. Uh, I took the train down from New York and I, <laughs> I went to go visit him and we, um, we had words. I'm like, oh no, here it comes. And she said, are you, he's asked me, are you seeing anybody? And I said, yes, I am. And I told him about you. And he said that he had seen you on Jay Leno or, or some show like that. And he, he said, um, well, is he a, a nice man? He has these tattoos. He seems to be uh, a bit of a psychopath. And, <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, well, you know, it's, it's okay. Maybe if he met me, he might like me a little better, you know, whatever. And he's like, and, but then, you know, I, 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 well, I, I didn't like the way he said that. That was insulting to me. And I, I said, you know, Father, I, I have, I have my own life. And everyone in the restaurant is like, <laughs> like, what? Look at the pretty young woman screaming at the top of her lungs at this guy. Oh, it's the liar guy. Oh, it's Mr. MTV. <laughs> and so now all eyes are like, and she's just like, I've told him time and time again. I'm a, I, am, I, I am a gentleman. I am very loath to say, shut the fuck up. You will not see me taking a dinner roll and shoving it in someone's mouth. <laughs> but actors tend to need to use the room. They need to fill up space. They are very self-aware. They make their money being someone else, you know? And so I said to her, I saw White Squall. And she went, you did? And I went, oh, that's right, the actress thing, the need for approval. I said, I liked it very much. <gasps> oh, thank you. That's all we needed to, that, that could have been it. Oh, thank you, move on. So let, let's meet your kid so he can like grind his face into your leg like all the other ones have. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Well, we had a wonderful time shooting that film, but we, uh, I mean, it was, it was incredible to be paid to, to live on a boat in, in, in the West Indies. It was very, I'm like, okay, that's, that's really great. I said, you know something about that film? When you died at the end, I cried. It made me cry. <gasps> you cried. She just, <gasps> You did? I mean, she's look, you know, she looks at me like, well, uh, I don't mean to be insulting, but you don't seem like the person who would be able to bring himself to cry, or especially watching a movie. I said, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I hated to see you die because you saw how, how horribly torn apart the husband was, and it made me cry. You know, it moved me. She's like, oh, and then she starts using the kitchen. She starts using the room. Well, and he starts, she starts talking about the character in the third person. Oh, I hate when they, people do that. There's only one or two people in the world who should be allowed to talk about themselves in the third person. James Brown and Jerry Lee Lewis. Because they are, what they do is larger than what they are. You know what I mean? And when James Brown goes like, ha, when James Brown gets on stage, you don't even think twice. Like when Bob Dole was saying that shit during the debates. If you want to learn more about Bob Dole... Get on my website. <laughs> Except you fags. You know? <laughs> that was in subtitles. That was the uh, closed for a uh, caption uh, uh, view. So she's like, well, I didn't know how to play her in that scene. I didn't know whether I should be like, ah, am I, what I'm like, I'm like, shh, hey, 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 look. I only cried because I was fucked up, okay? <laughs> I hadn't slept in two days. I was like nine and a half cups of coffee. Yeah, I cried. I cried because I was out of my fucking mind. She's, and she sees like compliment window rapidly closing. So she went, thanks, bye. I I've never seen her again. She was out of there. So that's the shit that occurs to me. I, I came up with this other really cool idea that occurred to me during a bout of exhaustion. Lay I was laying over in o uh, in at O'Hare in Chicago, but we'll get to that in about four or five hours, right, uh, right near the, ha the halfway mark. <laughs> I wanted to tell you about this um, strange transformation I went through last year. Uh, all the guys in my band, they, they live in New York. 
So when, when we have to get together to make music, I go to the East Coast and live in New York. Now, the time I was there before, the last time we made a record, I lived in a furnished apartment. You know, you, you rent this little box, and has the bad TV, bad couch, bad rickety bed, but has pots and pans and a phone. You really don't have to do anything except show up, and it's all there. Refrigerator, stove, you know, but it's, it's rickety, but it's all set up. It is really expensive. So I realized when I made... Uh, we're making this record. We're going to be there for a long time working on this thing, like at least a year. So in order to save some money, I figured I got to get a real apartment. I got to bite the bullet and really move into this town. The times I've been to New York, which are many, and I'm sure you've all been there. For those of you who've been there, you know what I'm talking about when I say it's you know, some of the most belligerent, vocal people in the world. A very warm bunch, but <laughs> very vocal very into getting right in your face. It's a very touchy-feely town. You have body contact with strangers on a daily basis. You get on any subway heading towards Times Square between 6 and 9 a.m. You are but a human sardine in a compressed car of humanity. You get in, you have your face buried in some beautiful woman's hair care products. <laughs> You're like, hmm. Be, from behind you, you feel some warm, something warm prodding the cleft of your ass. <laughs> you rip your head away from the hair care products, and there is some Wall Street banker guy c pushed against you, yes, grinding his pelvis into your ass. And you look back at him, because, you know, it feels okay, but, <laughs> but you at least want to get a, a business card or something, you know? And he, you look back at him, and he, he gives you that New York look. Yeah, that's right. I'm grinding into your ass with my pelvis. I'm also on a packed subway. Welcome to New York, you fuck. And all of that is given to you in this deadpan stare, like, yep, yeah, I'm fucking you, pal. <laughs> then he looks right over your shoulder. You know, it's something else, like, mmm, like, every day. Mm -hmm. And the guy behind him is grinding into his ass, too. So I'm being gently fucked from behind. I'm smelling like Clairol 950.7 hair straightener or whatever, you know, some, you know, intense hair manipulator. And then I smell what smells like someone shit their pants. <laughs> I, you know, I got a face full of, you know, some blonde hair. Like, no, it's not her. There's a homeless guy his cock is grinding against this side of me. He's like breathing on me. His, his body, that, his clothes that he lives in like nine days a week that he shits in and screams in and sweats in and pisses in, he's wearing it. It's now on me. My olfactory senses go into red alert. They shut down my nasal cavities. They will not allow this fetid air to come into me. Uh, <coughs> My brain's going, no, I'm sorry. We have sunk really low. We are not inhaling that. We'd rather see you die than inhale that. And you're like, <clears throat> and you get out of the subway like four stops later, having been, you know, pumped in the ass, have some man's fecal matter rubbed on, on you with a face full of Clairol. This is the New York experience. And I noticed that cabs and cars beep at each other what, for, what seems to be no reason. At a red light, cabs will beep at each other, I guess because they're mad that the guy ahead of them will not run the red light. <laughs> like, red light, beep, beep, fuck you, beep, beep, beep. Like, what are they doing? The intersections are just this cacophony of <laughs> and swearing and flipping off. Never any fights, just a lot of hot air, a lot of steam, a lot of noise. One day I was walking down Houston and I was crossing Houston and Bowery and there was some cars stopped and uh, they're going downtown and they're all beeping of course because they're pissed off that they're not moving at 90 miles an hour down a normal four lane street. You know, they drive so fast, they have to get there now, which is kind of cool if you're a guy like me. You know, you get in there like, uh, could you please floor it? You know, like, you see like, you know, people say shopping carts flying by. You know, they just like edge people back on the, on the corner. Get the fuck back on the sidewalk. Check this out, postman, two o'clock. 
you know, they're maniacs, but you get there quick. They can get you from Manhattan to Brooklyn in like 18 seconds. They're awesome if they know where they're going. Sometimes you have to break out the map and show them how to get uptown. So anyway, there's this one cab driver at the intersection. He's beeping his horn, and instead of getting that like, ear-ringing, blood-curdling noise that makes your, feel, your fillings fall out of your head, his horn was dented. Like The, the pipe that goes to the horn was like, dented or, or squashed or something, because all that came out of his, his horn was, ha, ah, ha. Ah. And it was sonorous. It almost sounded, it almost sounded nice. And, I looked down, to look in at him, and you could see his frustration that his horn was not causing unrest. And he's in there like, ha, ha. And you know, like, uh, a typical male, I'll fix it, I'll hit it harder, that'll make it work. Ha. And I decided to have some fun, so I looked through the glass and looked at him so he could see that I saw that his shit was weak. So I'm like, He's like, oh, I'm like, <laughs> he's like behind me, like, I, 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 so fucking mad. <laughs> and so finally the light turns, he's like, <laughs> he like killed four people by the time he got to the other side, he was so pissed. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if the next morning everyone's horns had been, you know, uh, changed and all the sounds were like all different. The guy, you know, gets onto the main road, first blast of the day, he hits the horn. (laughs) Windswept mountain. (laughs) New age sound. (laughs) The guy next to him. (laughs) You fucking pussy, check me out. Hello, I like you. I think we can be friends. Looking good today. Peace. The guy in the next lane looks up at the trucker. (laughs) You're so lightweight. Whale sounds, it's like sperm whales in Antarctica. (laughs) Intersections just could turn into these like beautiful new age seminars. Oh, that's the timber wolf looking for his mate. Oh, that'd be so awesome instead of like this shrieking madness at every intersection in New York. So when when I was merely a uh, monthly rental, a furnished apartment resident, I could never understand why New Yorkers are the way they are. Why they have to like get in your face, talk on you, touch you, hey man. Some guy just like smacks you on your shoulder blade. Hey, I'm like, yeah? I saw your shit. Oh, no you didn't. (laughs) No, I saw your shit on MTV, right? I'm a liar, right? You're that fucking guy. I'm a liar! I now have like, you know, cheese omelet all over my face. Makes me regret any record I've ever done. You're like, yes sir, I am he. Here's your breakfast back. Oh what, you can't talk to me? Oh, I'm not fucking good enough for you? Attitude. I'm like, no, no, you're, you're fine. I just don't like your breakfast on me. Oh, I don't like your breakfast on me. What the fuck is with you, man? I thought you were fucking... You know, fuck you! I'm like, I'm going to leave before I get killed. Goodbye. I just wanted to go to band practice, you know? Why are they like this? I don't know why. I had theories. You know, urban compression. Men and women living 40 floors, stacked. Stacked on top of each other. All having to shop in supermarkets where everything is 60% more expensive per item in aisles that are this wide that force you to rub the old woman's ass as you go by. (laughs) Where there are like only two cans of Campbell's soup, you know, one variety, and you have to vie with some old woman and have a tug of war with it. Give that to me. And she's like some 187-year-old Ukrainian woman. Fuck you! You got that butt back, motherfucker! Fuck you! The women who have the beard and mustache who walk alone, muttering that really weird, oh, go 
God. <laughs> when they get in there, like they, they plant those heels. Fuck you, you goddamn son of a bitch. <laughs> why are they like that? I did not know why until I got my own apartment. There are two ways to go about getting your own place in, in the East Village of New York. You can stand with 50 people in a line, get marched into a tiny roach-infested box, and inspect it, and everyone will go, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. I want the apartment, I want the apartment. And you can get in a fist fight with these people, and the person standing on top of the other 49 dead bodies, they'll drop the homicide charges, um, but you will have to pay for the, uh, the body dumping fee. Um, it's only $35 a body. So you have like 35 times 50, I don't know what that is, 35 times 50 to dump the bodies, and then you have to pay first, last, and, and uh, a month's rent deposit. Or you can hire a realtor who has inside connections. You know, there's buildings that are owned by certain companies. He works with them, like a travel agent. They call him first. Hey, we got this apartment opening up December 1st. You want to bring your people in? We'll give you the first crack. So... You can hire the realtor. The realtor gets 15% of 12 months' rent. And the average rent on an apartment in New York is, in, in the village, is eleven to $1,500 a month. So you do first, last, month's deposit, and 15%, basically four and a half months' rent or something, just to get in a tiny roach-infested box. This is what I did. Because so I didn't have time to stand in line and, and kill a bunch of people just to go live in a box. And I, I had to go to band practice. I had to make a record. So I, I said, okay. I call up this realtor place. I go, you do this, right? He goes, yeah, we do this. I go, here's my number. Call me at band practice when you got the place. Two days later, he calls me up. He says, okay, I found you three places to look at. Meet me here at my office after band practice. We'll go check them out. I go, fine. We walk to one on 7th Street, 32 East 7th Street. Walk in. Walk up to the second floor, uh, 2B. Open it up. I walk in. It is a tiny roach-infested box. I said, I'll take it. He said, well, let's go look at the other two places. They're two blocks over. You might like them a little better. No, I'm not going to walk anymore. Um, I, I don't care where I live, okay? It doesn't matter. He goes, well, how about we look at all three? In 10 minutes, you have seen all three apartments, and, you know, uh, you can get any one of them. I have them wide open, and you can do this. Want, let, let's go look at the other ones. You might like it a little better. You know, it's up to you, but I think you should look at all of it. Nope. Sir, I'm a dedicated musician. I can live anywhere for the sake of rock and roll. I'm going to be coming into this place, sleeping, waking up, going to band practice, going to the gym, coming back, sleeping, waking up. Going to, I'm just going to, I'm a machine. I'm a machine. I'm a rock and roll weightlifting machine. That's all I'm going to do. And the guy went, okay, fine. A few days later, the paperwork goes through. I'm given my keys. I go with my two backpacks and my, my, box of, my cardboard box of provisions and um, my box of blankets and bedding, which I'll explain about that in a moment, and I go into the apartment, you know, my own, my own joint, and I look at my apartment door, and I notice that the door is bowed slightly like this, and it has been broken into about four or five times. Someone has crassly kicked this fucking thing down a few times, and they stomp it flat again, and they stand it back up, and the, where the hinges go in the door jam have been replaced, and they put in that fake plaster stuff so they can get bolts to go through, and the lock has been ripped out with a crowbar, so they move it up like a foot so they can drill a new hole for it to go into the door jam. So the old one is covered with sheet metal, and the, uh, now you have to put your key up here. It's just really ridiculous and you see where they've tried to break into that one but they couldn't get enough leverage or something it's unreal you go wow someone has popped this place at least four times or maybe more uh i'm the target for like the next crack hit you know so i go in i turn on the light it's the afternoon and i i look around my place and then it hit me what a chicken shit you know normal male i am i am used to going into places and opening up a drawer and there's knives and forks and a can opener. None of this stuff have I ever bought. I don't know where one buys a can opener, really. Now, like, who goes and like, says, today I buy a stapler? <laughs> I'm going to go buy some liquid paper. I'll be right back. You don't buy liquid paper. You go to someone's office and you go, like, what's that over there? <laughs> you don't buy a can opener. You, 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 mommy always had one. You went into the kitchen, you opened up a drawer. And there's a can opener and some SpaghettiOs. You did not buy any of this stuff. The pot to cook it, it was there. Maybe God put them there. <laughs> you move into your first hovel, and you remember your first hovel. It was awesome, right? Maybe you're still in it. I mean, you remember. 
You open up a drawer, there's a fucked up can opener in there, but there's one in there. And there was no couch. Two days later, yeah, hey man, I'm moving out. You guys want this couch? If you can carry it in here, you can have it. Cool. <laughs> you have a couch. Boom. Damn man, it'd be really cool if we had a TV. Hey, man, I'm moving out from upstairs. I got this old fucked up TV. I know you guys just moved in because I saw my buddy give you that couch. If you guys can carry the TV downstairs, you can have it, man. Cool. Three flights of stairs up. You walk in. And I, I've, I've actually weighed this, so I know what I'm talking about. It's the old home entertainment center from the 60s. The TV was one third of it. The, the other two thirds was a speaker and a turntable has a power amp, the whole thing weighs, and this is the part I actually looked up, it weighs 917 pounds. <laughs> the speaker is blown. If you turn it up a little bit, <laughs> the turntable has not worked since Kennedy was assassinated. <laughs> and the picture is fuzzy at best when it works. <laughs> you, magically, you and your bro pick this thing up, nearly die four times, bark the shit out of it and going down the stairwell. Get it into your hovel. <laughs> magically, forks, blankets, pillows start coming into your apartment. Did you pay for any of it? No, you just acquire. You acquire the shit. It's like you open the window, a plate flies through. It just happens. I walked into this place, there was nothing. And then I came to the grim realization that I was going to have to go out and buy all that stuff. And for a rock and roll road warrior animal like myself, to buy a can opener is to wave the white flag of domesticity. It is to admit <laughs> defeat. You, sir, are going down. You are going away. You are buying domestic home items. You pussy. <laughs> and so... I had to find a place on 14th Street where they sell all that shit. And I walked in like, Excuse me, ma'am, I need some help. Yes, sir. I'd like a hand towel. What color? I don't know, just put it in the fucking bag. Just... <laughs> Black if you have it, you know. <laughs> Would there be anything else? I need one of the, the oval things with the spikes on it to put the bar of soap on. Oh, that's so nice. Shut up, just put it in there. Right? <laughs> don't let anybody see me, okay? I need, a, um, I need a, a, a pot for, you know, cooking stuff. Well, what kind of pot? Well, you know, a pot for like, okay, a pot like to cook meat products in, you know, like cans of meat products. You know, a, a tough guy pot, you know? <laughs> a pot used by like a guy with a big dick, okay? <laughs> and, she's, and she goes, oh yes, the dollar thirty-nine one over here. <laughs> And I need a can opener. I'm sure you'd like the 29 cents special. The one where you put it on one can, you're like, eh, and the thing strips and comes off in your hand. Because typical men, that you, you buy the fork, you touch a marshmallow to it all the time, it's going, <laughs> you just buy the cheapest shit. You know, no way, if I have to buy this stuff, I'm not gonna put any money into it. <laughs> you know, so I, I bought, I, I go staggering back to the apartment with like this Santa Claus bag of domestic items. Later, I was to find out that when you buy the $1.39 pan, the one you've never really used because, you know, you're only used to using your mommies with the big Teflon handles, the ones that cost like 11 bucks, like, <gasps> you'd never, what guy in here, what self-respecting, cock-carrying male would ever spend 11 fucking dollars on something to heat up ravioli with, please? You know, like, we, we have evolved. We have come to our senses. We would never do anything like that with our money. That makes no fucking sense whatsoever. <laughs> So you heat up the thing, you're stirring it with like the spoon that even though it's metal, it's starting to like to bend just with the, the heat from the, like the SpaghettiOs or whatever. You take the pot off the stove, the cheap pot, the entire pot is one piece and it all heats up. You're like, <laughs> you lose all of your fingerprints. Your hand is shiny for like a year and a half of scar tissue buildup. You're cauterized. Ah, oh, God, help me! I went staggering home with all this domestic stuff, and I throw it down, and I'm putting it all out. I had this soap dish, you know, the little soap thing with my stolen hotel soap to go on. And I had the fucking hand towel. I don't know why I bought it, so there you go. And I, I put all that stuff out, and I opened up my other box, which had my sheet, my blanket, and my pillow from L.A. UPSed out. I was too cheap to buy another blanket, pillow, and sheet. 
just will not do it, will not buy it twice. The, sh the, uh, the sheet was, uh, I found it in some apartment I moved into years ago. It says, it says belongs to some hospital. It's mine now. <laughs> the pillow was stolen by someone in Black Flag in 86, and it was in the van I took it home. It's 11 years old. It's like that, that one of those super El Cheapo pillows in the hotels where I guess they don't want you to come back. It's like all corks and rocks inside. Like it drops like a bean bag, like <laughs> and you like you just like pound it into the shape of your head and kind of place your head in it. And you wake up the next morning, all these divots on the side of your head. That's what I got. And the blanket is really an orange bedspread stolen by one of the Feelys in 1988 and was left in the van we rented to go out on tour. So it was in the van, stolen by a Feely. I took it back to my apartment. I've had it ever since. It has no natural fiber in it whatsoever. You flick a cigarette ash on it, it goes into total flame out in 0.5 seconds and will melt you into your mattress. <laughs> You're, you are a dead man. <laughs> Gone. You'll be trapped under burning plastic for the rest of your life. This is what I got. I put it down, I open it up, I go, all right. And I realize to my horror, I have nothing to sleep on. I would love to be like Samurai Boy and sleep on the floor. I just can't do it. I would like to, but I can't. So I have to buy a futon. I'm like, no. Because this, you know, a pot is one thing. A mattress, a futon, that's, oh, that's commitment, you know? And you don't want someone in New York giving you a used futon. Because I know what I've done to futons that I had before. I only bought one, and this is one that I bought in New York. The one I had back in the mid-80s was left to me by a woman who was a roommate in my apartment. She moved back to Arizona, and I don't know, I forget what I was sleeping on before. I think I, think I was sleeping on some mattress that some guy gave me. So I threw that out. She gave me her futon. It was a double one, and it was about the size of my room. I had to fold it up under my table every day. And by the time I hit the late 80s, I had had so much sex on this thing, it would not bend anymore. Because that was that 80s carefree sex, like, Poof, wee! And like, you know, the, the, you just rub the load into the, into the futon. So, <laughs> after the, uh, the uproarious summer of 1989 had come to a close, this thing was like sheetrock. And uh, and it would not fold. It was like this, this glassy, uh, stiff, white square, which a friend and I stood up and moved out and pitched onto Hollywood Boulevard and, and never saw it again. You know, it would be a good surfboard or something. It was no good to sleep on anymore. Like, you could break your hand trying to hit it. So, um, <laughs> yeah, the 80s were a rough one, pal. So, anyway... I realize now I must buy a futon. I have to grow up, bite the bullet, and go buy one of these things. So I hike down to Orchard Street and Houston where there's a place that says futons. So I go in there. There's three sizes. They have the king size, which is the size of my apartment. They have the queen size, which would allow me one foot around the futon to walk. <laughs> and then there is the third size. Three and a half feet wide, five and a half feet long single, one buttock fits on it. If you lie down on your back, one piece of your ass goes onto the floor. You sleep like a knife. I said, I want one of those. Ah, yes, you'd like the loser size. So I gave him my money and I fold up my loser futon because if anyone sees you on that, they know you're not getting any. But you always try and front it. Oh, I'm, you know, I live alone, I'm Spartan, you know, I, Kind of like one of those rough and cuddly kind of detective guys in Lethal Weapon. Come on, get in here with me. You're leaving. Okay, you know. And so I fold the loser futon in half the long way, like a canoe, over my head. And go walking against traffic up 2nd Avenue. People are driving by. Beep, beep, loser! Those who recognize me. Yo, I'm a loser! <laughs> I'm walking back, I'm, shut up! 
And I get it up the stairs, I throw it down, I tear the plastic off, and I put the sheet on the blanket on top of that and the pillow at the end of it. There, there it is. Okay, evening descends upon me, it is now dinner time. I'm going to eat in my own place. So I go out, I buy a can of soup. You know, well, why don't you buy groceries for the week? Hey, man, I'm a day-to-day kind of guy. I could be dead tomorrow, man. (laughs) You know, I can't think that far ahead, you know. It's not my warrior spirit. So I buy a can of soup. Why? Because I'm, I'm just chicken shit. Oh, I don't want to spend $8. I'd rather just spend two fifty. dollars Okay. Even though you know you're going to spend it tomorrow, you just can't see that far. So I buy the can of soup. A corn, chicken corn chowder by Campbell's. I walk it back to the place. I open it with a new can opener, which, which promptly like dissembles itself. I have to glue it back together. Get the can open, dump it into the pot that would later scorch my hand to where I couldn't use it for a, a month and a half. And I'm heating up the thing, and, and I, I take this scalding piece of, of metal, and I, I tamp it out into my new plastic bowl, which smelled like plastic when I put hot stuff in it. So it was like, you know, I'm eating warm plastic in my soup. Great. So now my body, after I die, my legacy will not live on, but the plastic in me, I will half-life into the soil, you know, for years and years to come. And so anyway, I eat my soup. Time passes. I have three CDs in my boombox. I have Jailbreak by Thin Lizzy. I have In the Wee Small Hours by Frank Sinatra and A Love Supreme by John Coltrane, which is Damn, pretty much all you need, right? So I'm, I'm listening to my three records, like, all right. And, you know, I got my laptop. I'm, like, writing. I'm, like, I'm a New Yorker. I'm in my New York apartment. And I'm, like, 35 years old sitting on a loser futon in a shitty dump. going like, cool. <laughs> and so it is now time to go to bed. So, um, well, before I went to bed, I should tell you, um, I looked around my apartment finally to see what I, you know, see my new joint because I really didn't look at it, I just kind of went out, and bought the shit, brought it back, ate dinner, and I started checking out the place before I went to bed, and uh, a couple of observations about the place. One was this black metal pipe that goes through the middle of the apartment, through the ceiling, down to the floor, I, I don't know where it stopped. From November to March, the pipe burns with the intensity of hell. <laughs> like you walk by, fuck, God! <laughs> at the base of the pipe, where the pipe meets the floor, is a piece of like black cooked meat with singed hair on it. (laughs) Unmistakably cat hair. Now, you know how cats think that humans are but food servants and ass scratchers. (laughs) They feed the cat and the cat comes over and goes, oh, see my ass, touch it, come on, come on, touch it. (laughs) Oh yeah, come on. (laughs) And you, you, you pat them, you know, near the base of their tail and they're like, oh. And they're so, the feeling is so pleasurable that it builds up inside them and in way of release, they turn around and sink all four fangs into you as hard as they can. <laughs> You're swinging this 28 pound cat for your four, like, <laughs> and the cat goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. come on, touch it again, oh yeah, come on. <laughs> and so cats think that inanimate objects like them too like table legs and pipes from hell. And perhaps the cat grew up in the summertime and it spent a lot of the summer like rubbing its ass on the pipe, like, oh yeah, come on, oh yeah. And then came November. You know, it went over there, oh yeah. And there's like this little cat ham hock cooking away on the pipe. So, you know, I reckon better be careful from the pipe from hell. And this other observation you might find a bit funny. Um, My box only had but one sink. The sink was not in the bathroom. The sink was in the kitchen area of the box. That's how tiny this place was. There's no room for a sink in the bathroom. There was like a toilet. You step around it into the tub. And there's a room to get out, open the door, and get out. So the sink is a very essential part of a man's existence. When you go into the hotel or the apartment or whatever, the male will immediately go into the bathroom and close the door. Immediately go to the sink in the bathroom and size it up for height. Because there's gonna be a lot of jerking off going on in the sink. And all factors of the bathroom now come into play. Overhead lighting, 
wall tile color. Um, whatever's hung on the wall. I mean, some guys like to have uh, uh, pictures as incentive. Um, diesel engines, um, you know, large piston uh, component parts, rocket ships, whatever, or maybe a motivational phrase on the mirror overhead. You know, go for it. <laughs> Something. But sink height is very important, okay? Um, I realized that I was going to be doing a lot of work in the uh, kitchen sink. So I immediately bellied up to the kitchen sink to see what I was dealing with. And um, it's an old-fashioned work sink that goes deep and comes up high. You can wash the kitchen in it, you can wash the dishes in it, you, you, know, you can like wash your whole upper body in it. It's like an all-purpose big sink from like the 20s or 30s. It comes up to about here, which presents some problems. Now, you know, when we have a thing that stands in our way, we rise to the occasion. We, you know, we must hurdle mountains as if they were curbs. You must not let anything get in your way. Hey, man, don't let anything stop you, man. Didn't the guy in sticks write that? You know, that sounds like an REO song, you know. And so I want to show you how I overcame this seemingly uh, impossible obstacle, okay? So here we go. I'm standing uptown. I'm looking towards uptown. The sink is at my right side. I use a left-handed overhand stroke, okay? <laughs> A remnant from my days as a teenager, not wanting to be like everyone else. During the, the uh, punk rock new wave explosion, where we all must be different, unique and individual, I knew that my peers were at home like, so I'd show them a thing or two, overhand. So, sink to my right, erection pointing towards Central Park. Working steadily away, okay? About three strokes from victory, I shift about 95% of my weight to my right leg. Not all of it. Some, you want to have some presence, some weight on the left foot in case you have a blowout, you want to be able to default back to the left, okay? You'll notice that the right leg is slightly bent. It's not locked, not locked, slightly bent. Spring, right? So. I am working, five, four, three, come down on three. Okay, here, you know, pay attention now. This is where I crouch down a little bit, and this is a very explosive move. You can't do it halfway. It's a move you must commit to. Like when you see someone on the balance beam, when you see someone on the rings, it is a full commitment move. Either you go for it or you don't, but you don't do it halfway. Okay, explosive upward movement. When you lock out, you pivot out and pivot up. You are now moving up, out, and around. To augment your upward and clockward progress, you vault upwards with the right arm. Lumbar region now going up and around, head going more down, and a lot of this really has to do with, you know, you, your understanding that your right arm is now an axis upon which you are orbiting in a clockwise direction. Down for the second to last stroke, as I approach the sink, I am now over the sink, down for the last one, point, shoot, Keep moving counterclockwise. I'm way up here. Pull back, tuck, spin, dismount, downtown. My erection, which is now but a memory, is wilting towards Chinatown. Took me a few days to get it together, but I got it together. Okay, these are the things that I had to deal with on my first night. On the first night, there was no release. I was like... <sighs> so, I turned off the lights and I lay down to go to sleep. And the uh, first thing I heard was the radiator starting to make noise. 
That was it. For a moment, I was warm. Now I'm freezing cold again. Four minutes later, that's it. That's all you get. I'm hot. I'm hot. I'm freezing. I'm freezing. I'm freezing. That's all you get. Six minutes later, and the, the, the thing goes, and, and you see a little bit of steam come out with a knob turns at the floor of the heater. I have it all the way cranked counterclockwise. That's all you get. A little bit of vapor comes from it. Otherwise, cold as the dead. And I'm thinking, who is metering out this heat to me? What cruel and unusual person is trying to alternately boil me and freeze me to death as I sleep? I'm wondering if it is done manually, maybe by the superintendent, the invisible man who lives four to five floors beneath the Earth's surface. A man I never see yet puts the garbage in like five neat bags every Thursday morning. I'm envisioning a Danny DeVito-esque man in a tank top, hairy back, probably a hunchback, probably the, the ugly, deformed brother of the evil man who owns the entire block. And he lives in a tiny apartment building underneath the, underneath the earth. Earth's surface, no window, sweating, slightly damp cinder block walls. He sits in a broken blue easy boy chair watching bad black and white television, clutching a remote in one hand and a warm thing of malt liquor in the other. There's a tunnel that goes down every apartment building all the way down to 3rd Street, or up to, up to 3rd Street, rather. And he has to make the rounds, and he goes to every, down, every hallway, to every building's basement. <laughs> And keeps moving. So every six minutes he comes back and all night he goes back and forth, back and forth, turning on and turning off the heat, keeping himself sustained by eating centipedes off the wall. <laughs> I don't know what's going on down there. All I know is I'm burning, I'm freezing, I'm burning, I'm freezing. If they left it on just a little all night, eventually it would take the chill off the air. And the only thing hot in this place is the pipe from hell. So I'm trying to go to sleep with this hissing adder of a radiator in my corner. Soon after that, Underneath the floorboards, another sound comes. <laughs> what the fuck was that? There's a, there's a person snoring underneath me. It's going through the floorboards. I have paid to have a loser futon, yet I'm not sleeping alone. I'm sleeping with someone who's fucking snoring in the middle of my brain. So I double the cork and rock pillow. And bang my elbow into it to get a head divot in there. I, put my head in there, it goes right through it. <laughs> right in the settles, right in the middle of my brain. I don't know what to do. I fold a pillow. I try sleeping, you know, my head nearly breaking my neck. I can hear it every breath. So I figure, can't beat him, join him. I start breathing with this person, hoping that the snoring, if I sync, synchronize my breathing with this person, he'll lull me to sleep. <sighs> <sighs> and I'll just zen right into sleep. It does not work. That's when I become aggravated. And when you become aggravated and try to sleep, then you just defeat yourself. Like, yeah, you can get psyched up to go play football. You can get psyched up to go take on your boss. You can get psyched up to go confront your dad or whatever. Like, you sit in a room like, okay, come on, I can do this. Come on, ah, let's do it. You can't do that to try and go to sleep. Come on, sleep. Come on, come on, come on, REM sleep. Come on, come on. I'm so fucking tired. Man, am I relaxed. Come on, mellow out. Come on. It does not work. So I'm lying there. It's just... At this moment, the pipe from hell starts expanding and contracting. Ding, 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 ding. I'm out of my fucking mind. I realize I've just got a 12-month lease on a lemon of an apartment. I'm burning, I'm freezing, I'm clanging, snoring, and snorting pipe. Hours go by, I'm looking at a black ceiling. I'm waiting for sleep to come, but it will not come. Me being a living person, my bladder starts to fill up, as it will at night. And the length to the bathroom, the distance to the bathroom becomes a journey too far. That's when you start having those strange dreams. I don't know how they are for you, but I shall now detail briefly mine. <laughs> I'm standing. I cannot see my body. I can only see what's in front of me. It's either a lavatory stall or the woods. Coming from my body is a beautiful, 
fire hose diameter arc of gold <laughs> that falls without breaking into the darkness silently. The feeling of relief I have is beyond belief. It's like, ah, uh, it's like taking the nesty plunge. Ah, uh, it feels so good. It's like walking on puppies. Ah. Uh. And in the middle of my sheer relief and ecstasy comes a warning flare. Wake up, wake up! Ed, 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 Ed. You're pissing in your futon! You wake up. Ah, ah. Oh, God, thank God. So, before that happened, I figure I'll get up and relieve the bladder. It's the only constructive thing I'll do tonight. Otherwise, I'm sitting in my bed, cooking and freezing, and grinding my teeth, and wanting to kill the snorer below me. I edge carefully through the darkness, not wanting to stub my foot up against something in my unfamiliar area. I've not lived there all that long, so I'm moving carefully towards the bathroom, which is about 10 feet over this way. I'm moving, I am moving. The pipe from hell goes right between my two hands, and me and the pipe from hell bond right here. And for at least point like 005 excruciating seconds, me and the pipe from hell are one, bonded in black metal and cooking flesh. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ! <laughs> you know, like, you know, this uh, shiny like rectangle on my chest forevermore. Like, oh, God. Uh, uh. Go into the bathroom to disturb the progress of at least 25 roaches on my wall. You all have encountered insects in your place, right? And ro roaches are magic. They know every crack and divot. And it is about three times smaller than their body, yet they walk into that crack without any problem whatsoever. Or they vault off a flat surface, like off the edge of a table, like, I can go anywhere I want! And they'll hit the floor, and you will clock their downward progress. They disappear. It's as if they hit the ground and just go into the ether. This is a, sur a superior survival species. When you are eating something and a crumb of food too minute to your human eye falls from the corner of your mouth and hits the floor, as soon as you leave the room, the roach will come out, take it, and take it back behind the stove and create 60,000 little babies with the protein and carbon inside that food item. They are merely biding their time for us to fuck up so they can take the world back. And that's it. They're all waiting behind some home appliance right now. They are living inside your clock radio, waiting, breeding, taking a new insecticide, mutating around it, becoming stronger, waiting patiently for us to fuck up. And then they will, they will rule California. The roaches and the scorpions and the coyotes will come back out of their holes and go like, finally, it took millions of years, but we have won! That's why I try and kill these little bastards to stave off the impending insect kingdom. And so my bathroom is like a frozen meat locker, and the old roaches can't move all that fast. So they're like, oh, no. And I'm giving them encouragement. I'm like, oh, I'm breathing on them to like, like warm them up a little, and they're trying to make some progress. And I'm giving them encouragement. Come on, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. Yep, you're almost there. You're almost there. And poof, you're dead. You're dead. You're dead. You're dead. Die, 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 die. I'm just killing bugs left and right. I'm a fucking killing machine. Dick in one hand, leaking away, dead bugs in the other. I'm... The chest burning. Finish the leak, go staggering back to my futon, lie down. Around 5 a.m., exhaustion bludgeons me into unconsciousness. I have, like, power sleep. I dream of, like, black cement. <coughs> so, so deep am I sleeping. You could, you know, drop a, a brick on my forehead. I'd be like... <coughs> At 6.01 a.m., the construction behind the building that I neglected to see out the window...
because I did not, could not bring myself to touch the grimy, you know, Venetian blinds when I got the joint. They, they were d- d- leveling the old Fillmore East and erecting this condominium in its place. And so at about 6.01, two external power generators to power three jackhammers starts simultaneously with about six men singing under the boardwalk at the top of their lungs. I hit the ceiling and hit the ground. I put the pillow on top of my head. I put my sweatshirt on top of my head. I stuck wet pieces of paper in my ears. Nothing would drown out the noise. I was now up after about 61 minutes of sleep. I listen. Everyone in the building is now up. I hear toilets flushing, angry feet stamping, coffee machines grinding, Howard Stern permeating through walls, people playing music in protest to the outside construction. And the guy next to me has this thing about playing either Natalie Merchant's last record or the Eagles' greatest hits at ear-splitting volume. The Eagles coming, Hotel California, so intensely bombarding my wall that the wall is breathing in time with the kick drum. You know, it's another tequila star banging me in the face. Howard Stern above me. I, I, I can't get laid. I like dykes. People smacking their kids. Ah, why you do that, you fucking bitch? Shut up, you little bump and smack her. About an hour later, after not being able to go to sleep, I decide it is now time to take the first shower in my place. I go in with my hotel soap, about that big, the kind when you're washing your ass, you lose, you're like, oh, (laughs) oh, damn, be careful. You know, that's why you should buy a bigger bar, unless you want a a strange boyfriend. So, So I'm in there, turn on the hot water, and rust water comes out, which is normal when you haven't been in a place for a while. You know, you come back to the vacation home after a long winter and you, you know, turn on the water. Of course, it's all murky. So I haven't, no one's been in this apartment for like a week. So, of course, the water's rusty. It comes out looking like, you know, good, strong coffee. Wait, <laughs> wait for like a minute. It thins out to strong tea where it remains. I'm like, <laughs> that's it. I get tired of standing around in a freezing bathroom. So me and my little thing of soap and my little tiny Best Western uh, shampoo go in and we take a shower in uh, this rusty water and I, you know, wash off. And I come out of the shower like you come out of the ocean, like when you're dipped in salt, the wind blows, you don't feel it because you're caked in this thin layer of salt. I am, I'm like caked in a thin layer of like oxidizing metal. No matter how you comb your hair, it just looks like you, you just like spat in your hair and smooth it to the side. You look like you're wearing some really bad toupee. I come out looking like very bad, feeling all sticky. I put my clothes on. I go like, I know what I'll do. I'll make a cup of coffee. This will solve everything. I didn't buy any. There's no coffee. There's no food. The only food there is is the remnants of the drying soup on the lid of the soup can, which is now being consumed by a roach the size of my fist. And I was too afraid to touch it, you know? So uh, I'm not going to vie for like a a lick of dried soup with a a bug that could like eat a dog. So (laughs) fine. (laughs) I mill around inside the apartment until it's time to go to band practice, getting madder and madder at the construction and people banging and jamming and slamming on the walls. I grab my backpack. I go out of the apartment with so much blind, belligerent fury that has never occurred to me to have while waking up in the morning. I walk outside, clear in my mind that everyone should die. And the first person I see, I'm just going to fuck with because, man, fuck you. A little old woman coming up the street to the Ukrainian church that is about four doors away. Hey, huh? fuck you. Fuck me. Fuck you, you dumb son of a bitch. I'll come fucking kick you. Ah, ah. Voila, a New Yorker is born. I go staggering into the village. Fuck you. Fuck you, beep. Fuck you. My last great move of belligerence was a few weeks ago when I was there. Had to do a photo session. Took a cab to the photo session. The UPS truck behind me was angry that I did not throw myself out of the rear window of the moving cab, thus not you know, making him have to stop. The cab does come to a stop. I get out. I close the door. The UPS truck starts beeping. A year ago, if I got out of a cab and the UPS truck was beeping, my action would be like, Sorry, you know, God, whatever. Get on the sidewalk and walk away. Oh, no, no, that has all changed now. 
That has all changed now that I have been living in New York and had to wait three weeks to get a phone installed. All this has changed. I go behind the cab who just jets off, stand in front of the UPS truck, and go, fuck you, bitch! And waited for him to come out so I could fucking kill him. And he's just like looking at me from way up high in the truck. He looks down at me and just goes like. And I was like. <laughs> and I wanted blood too. I would have bitten him in his face. I would have taken his ear home. I'd have his ear around here right now with a UPS earring in it. And I got back out to Los Angeles where like no one looks at each other unless, you know, there's trouble. No one talks to each other. You look at someone in traffic in L.A. like. The guy goes, yeah. you don't talk to the policeman. Excuse me, officer. Please stand 30 feet away from me. Sorry. Ask your question. Fuck you, citizen. <laughs> and so I had to learn to cool my shit out. Because in L.A. or in California, California is a very tough town, you know? It's, people get killed here a lot. It's a very violent part of the world. And if you do that, like, you, you looking at me, what? Which is the typical New York thing, what, what? You do that around here, like, what, what? This is what. <laughs> That's cool, you know? So I, I was lucky enough to like have a few days alone in my apartment where I could like downshift back to the real world. Because if you pull off that hot-headed New York thing like in New Orleans, they'll just never talk to you again. How are y'all doing? How are y'all doing? Do you have fucking double vision? What are you, schizophrenic? There's only one of me here, you fuck. Man, get the fuck out of my face. Give me that fucking menu, man. What's this? F fuck you. Stabbing the four with a fork, you know? Which in New York, if you stab the waitress at a, at a diner in, in New York, she, it's no big deal. You look, she has a bunch of like scars on her forehead where the other five guys stuck a fork in her forehead. She's like, yeah, fuck you. You want, you want fries of that? I mean, it's no big deal. So luckily I've been able to cool myself out. I wanted to remember about four and a half hours ago when you still feel your ass. I had one of the, I said I had this brainstorm in an airport while on exhaustion. Here it is. Um, Several months ago, when we were in the studio uh, making the record that we uh, have just finished, we were uh, up in upstate New York, and I got my own room, and I got a TV in there. And I never really watch TV unless I'm in a hotel. I, I have a TV at home, but it only gets video, the video machine. I do not have a cable. I will not watch television. Um, I just figure I, I'd rather read a book. I'd rather write a book. I, I'd rather talk to you. I'd rather do anything but have my brain getting a shitty hand job by Baywatch. You know? I like, I like the Learning Channel. I like uh, the Discovery Channel. I mean, I, I think that's cool. Like, you know, animals that kill. All right, let's see a shark eat fuck some shit up. I was at a hotel the other day and I watched a, like a lion or a tiger tackle a full-grown zebra and just shred it. That was awesome. Way more awesome than anything Roseanne Barr could ever utter out of her mouth. That, you know, the migration habits of the snowy egret. I'll watch it. Birds and how, fucking and flying around. Oh, sure. You know, like the caterpillar, cool. You know, but that, that corny bullshit TNA show like Baywatch just insults the shit out of me. And it tells you that you do have enemies. Okay, now that's a very super paranoid conspiracy theory, you know, boy, kind of statement. The people who make Baywatch are my enemy, really. Henry, don't you think you're just pushing it a little bit? No, and here's why. <laughs> Everyone in here has at least watched some of Baywatch. If I had a huge picture of Pamela Anderson behind me, you'd say, that's the Baywatch lady. You'd know who I was talking about. I watched an episode of Baywatch last year. I sat down and watched it. So I wanted to see what the most viewed television show in the world was, was. I wanted to see an episode and check it out. What I saw was these women with implants forced into, sh forced into swimming suits that would hold a six-year-old girl, okay? <laughs> the next thing you do is you give these women barely any dialogue whatsoever. Why? Because the, the suits are so tight and the implants are so intense, pressing so much against the rib cage that they cannot get full breaths of air in. So they go like, he's in the water. Oh, save him. 
and they're having trouble breathing. That's why the intense rescue scenes are very short, because these poor women cannot get enough air into their body to hold themselves up. Plus, they're carrying these, like, you know, nine-liter saline implants, which are going to drag you to the bottom and dash you into the coral and kill you. Also, we must be able to see the labia split. They're basically giving their labias a nice wedgie with those things, which sends middle America into spasms, you know. Oh, I can see it. Oh, fuck. And of course, <laughs> Bubba, she's shaving it. I know, I know. Oh, you got wood. No, I don't, you motherfucker. You know? So, what happens next? We get these able-bodied babes to the water. Warm body, cold water, erectile tissue. Bing ratings, bing, we got another season. Impossible plot lines. We're gonna get in a speedboat in the early morning on a cold ocean with nothing on but these bathing suits. We are up at Dawn, after working all day, our hair is perfect, makeup on, looks like we slept eight hours, and we're saving David Hasselhoff from some peril. Why you'd want to save that guy from anything is beyond me. <laughs> David Hasselhoff is being eaten by lions. Yes, I know, they cost me a fucking fortune. So the nipples are erect going to the rising sun as they go bounding over the water to save Hasselhoff, who has that, I uh, come from a long line of dogs who have been bred too much look like that. <laughs> if you notice, it is the same kind of dim stare and the same kind of dull conviction of Michael Bolton. <laughs> Check them out. They both have that, like, like, what? Why do they hate me? <laughs> Here's the enemy part. There are men and women who are grown up and very intelligent who sit in rooms and conspire for days to write this crap, okay? You are awake 12 to 18 hours a day and your time is very important. Remember about four hours ago, I was saying people don't value your time, their time? Okay, you know what? Your time is important. What you think is important. What you want to do with yourself is really fucking important. And if you try for a triple instead of trying for the home run, you're blowing it because you're awesome and you must realize that otherwise they got you and they can, they can just rip you off and fuck your mind up and sell you on really cheap, bullshit, mediocre, time-wasting thoughts and social patterns, like racism, like homophobia, like all that just mediocre, just stupid, corny crap that they can just fill you with soon as you get off your high level, which you all are at, if you choose to be there, and go down the middle of the road and become, you know, like, burger flipper man. <laughs> Because when you have a job like that, that's when Anheuser-Busch becomes an alternative to real life at 6 p.m. <laughs> that's what I always thought alcohol, tobacco, and drugs were. The same thing, which I'll get into in a moment, the same thing just like the China Wall, crowd control. We'll get to that concept in just a second. Baywatch, adults write this crap. They want you to sit and watch the 42 minutes of programming and the 18 minutes of commercials. They do not want you to move. They want you to buy it and they want you to watch this stupid park your fucking brain in the slow lane bullshit. Soft TNA display, okay? These people do not like you. If they liked you, they would not want to rape and insult your intellect and intelligence with this stuff. They are your enemies. They do wish you ill. F do not give in to it. And like, I know that's a little bit too intense, but you know what? You have a lot of enemies. If you are a free-thinking, tolerant person, you have a lot of fucking enemies. And that's one in a long line. And that's just my opinion. I could be very wrong. Moving right along to the Great China Wall. <laughs> Remember about 10 minutes ago? 10 minutes ago I said, I was in this room making the record. They gave me a TV. So, of course, I watched it. And I was watching this documentary on the Great Wall of China. And it was either it was Leonard Nimoy or Leonard Soundalike. And they, he's narrating, he's reading this stuff about the Great China Wall, which is an amazing structure. You've either been there or you've seen a picture of it or you may have see, even seen this documentary. So they're showing beautiful aerial shots of the wall that just goes and goes, waves up and down the hills. And the Leonard, the Leonard guy says, 
Where the countryside is most impenetrable to enemy attack is where the wall is at its highest. But yet, where the countryside is at its most vulnerable is where the wall is at its lowest. Was the wall used to protect en the country from enemy forces? Or does it tie in with old Chinese ghost tales where ghosts are, cannot move in a horizontal position, thus this wall would protect the city inside? Why did they build the wall? Pipe in the weird New Age synth music. At four in the morning, you're watching a wall getting scared. Like, and here's another shot of the wall. Ah! Oh, stop! Oh, God! And I knew what was coming next. Maybe aliens came and built the wall. <laughs> maybe, maybe a flying, maybe an alien craft with advanced architectural designs came down, and these and these humans were trained by extraterrestrials to build this incredible structure. It defies the mind to see the Great China Wall, and we and experts will always wonder why the wall is there. Dun, 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 dun. I don't wonder shit. What these scientist guys never rip their heads out of their asses and come to the conclusion is, four, five, six, seven hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, how much was there to do with your waking hours? <laughs> hey, look over here, there's a bug. Cool, what is it doing? It's crawling and stuff. Let's watch it all day, okay? Come here, look, there's some dirt. Wow, the sun sure is hot. Wow, the sun's going down. Moon sure is bright. Look at that dirt. People had a lot of time on their hands, you know, until they figured out how to ferment, you know, grain, you know, and make it into alcohol. Well, there's always fucking, but, you know, that's over and done with pretty fast. <laughs> Gotta go. I'm checking out some dirt over here. So if you said to thousands of people in like 1270, hey, look, drop the dirt you're looking at. Let's go get a bunch of rocks and make this big fucking pyramid out of the sand so we can bury the king after he's dead so we can go into the afterworld and live, you know, with, with the gods. All right. <laughs> you won't be able to complete the structure in your lifetime. It'll take about your, you know, your son and your grandson all like having cardiac arrest, hauling 30-ton rocks up an incline and probably being killed in the process. Okay. Let's build it. And that's how all this shit got built. It was not extraterrestrials. It was crowd control. When you have a large body of people, do you want them all thinking for themselves? No, because then they'll, they'll take your job. Then they'll outthink you. They'll come up with a better way of running things, and they'll go, guess what? Fuck you. You're out of here. So if you want to take care of, like, China, population, like, millions of people, I'm sure the guys who are running the place are looking out of the, the top floor of the Hilton down at all these people. Like, you know, Bernie, come here. Look at this shit. Oh my God, Saul, look at the fucking people down there. Well, what do you want to do with them? I don't know, got to keep them something to do. Got to keep them busy. Got to keep their minds off being individuals because if they start thinking for themselves, they're going to find real contempt for the system that keeps us up here in the gleaming tower and keeps them down there eating dirt. So we better give them something to occupy a whole bunch of their time and that makes them feel special because all people want to feel needed, all people want to feel involved in something that's great, and all people want to feel necessary to something. So let's take advantage of that need. Well, what should we do? I have it. We'll have them build a useless icon that will take many lifetimes and we'll tell them that they're bettering themselves by dissolving their individuality and going, going into like the mass consciousness. Well, what do you want to have them do? Have them build... <laughs> <laughs> what? What? <laughs> you know that fucking guy who had like the, the, the 30 foot strip of pink plastic going around that island outside of Florida. Oh, yeah, that avant-artist guy. <laughs> Half the people build a fucking wall that goes for miles and miles and miles. It'll never work. Look, they're looking at dirt down there. They got fucking dick to do. Come on, let's go have a press conference. They go down there. They can barely get it out. <laughs> you say it. Oh, shh, shh. Okay. <laughs> Great people of China. <laughs> You're going to take on a task that's going to show the world the power of the spirit of this, co <laughs> spirit of this country. <laughs> You're going to build a wall. You're going to build a wall. 
that will go and will symbolize your strength as a unit. You and your families will build it. Your family's families will build this wall. All right? Cool. And so they spent generations building this wall. And I was thinking in this airport, sitting there with this cup of coffee, trying to stay awake, thinking, man, aren't I a fucking genius? I, I have just made the Great China Wall into a metaphor for what's fucked up about America. We spend so much time building this useful, useless wall with your racial intolerance, with homophobia, with any kind of intolerance. You get to work for nobody building this thing with all of your time and your energy, and all it does is stand there and wear you out and make you stupid and make you dull. The idea... I'm sure no one in here is into the idea of racism, not a very nice thing. I've been reading this book, which I can suggest with, uh, with all confidence to you. I forget the name of the writer, but the book has just been made into a movie called The Ghosts of Mississippi. And um, the movie is, is cool, but the book is absolutely mandatory to read, I think. It's about the early days of the NAACP down in Mississippi and, and Alabama and, and down in the southern part of America. And it's about the death of Medgar Evers, uh, an NAACP leader, and his uh, killer, uh, Byron De La Beckwith, and his eventual prosecution in the 90s after he did the deed in 1964. And in this book, they document all the people who were members of the NAACP or around members of the NAACP who were executed by the Klan and how a lot of these cases never even went to court and how one man uh, was visited one night by a white guy, and everyone saw it was a, it was a white man in a car. He, the guy uh, w rang the, the black man's door, and the man opened the door and promptly got shot point blank in the face with a shotgun. And in the autopsy, they found lead particles in the man's skull. The judge r thought at the little inquest or trial thing, the judge figured that was the man's fillings that were, like, knocked out. It was, this was not a shotgun in the face. This was a home accident, and those were his fillings. And they brought in a dentist, and the dentist said, Your Honor, we never, ever, ever use lead for fillings. We never do it. And the judge said, You know, we really can't be sure unless we find the man who put the fillings in this man's head, and I'm sure we can't find him now, case dismissed. And no one ever got tried for this crime. And remember the, the uh, movie Mississippi Burning where the three young guys got killed and they took all year to find the bodies and stuff? Well, um, that name, Mississippi Burning, was the name of the FBI file for any civil rights violations and race crime down there. It's called the Mississippi Burning File. They dragged all the local bayous looking for uh, Goodman, Cheney, and, and, the, uh, and Schwerner. Um, they didn't find Goodman, Cheney, or Schwerner in there. They were under 15 feet of clay. Uh, down the road. They did find the bodies of like four other people who were executed by the Klan. So when you see the, the utterly hideous and obscene crimes that have happened, not like hundreds of years ago where if you were barbaric it was kind of okay because it's 1750 and you know no better and you're putting leeches on your skin to get rid of a fucking cold. It, you know, acts of barbarism are somewhat excusable because you're so fucking stupid you think that when clouds come and no rain comes you better cut off your wife's clitoris to like you know make it okay with God so you have crops next year you dumb bitch you got you kept the rain from falling lose it okay there now I have no feeling below my fucking panty line I sure hope the locusts don't come because I hate to see what I'm gonna lose when they fill the sky so when you're operating on that level of ignorance I'm not saying it's okay. I'm saying it does not raise an eyebrow when we read about it. But when, it's, when this was happening when I was alive, I remember waking up in the morning, going out to watch comics, you know, cartoons on the early TV and uh, seeing on the news that this man named Martin Luther King was assassinated. I remember going to my mom's bedroom, getting up on her bed, walking over her sleeping body, waking up going, Mom, Mom, a man named Martin Luther King has been killed. She got up and just had like a fucking shit attack ran around the house yelling and screaming, knocking things over. I thought she was mad at me. I didn't know. I, I, I cowered. When I, I, you know, I was hiding. I thought I had done something wrong, and she was just enraged that yet you know, another guy had been assassinated. So the idea of racial intolerance to me, uh, after uh, having visited Auschwitz a few months ago, which if you don't get a chance to do, you, you really should, because it's really great to be to, in a place where you realize a whole bunch of adults were wrong. 
you know, where people were really wrong. Because I love, the, I love when the idea of right and wrong gets reinforced, because you can have that pseudo-intellectual 3 a.m., too many cups of Denny's coffee discussion, like, well, you know, what's right for me could be wrong for you. This is no, really no, no real truth to the idea of right and wrong. You know, fuck that, okay? You go to a place like Auschwitz where you see an entire community that was built and dedicated to the destruction of human life. It, you go, yeah. There's right and there's wrong. And what this shit is about is wrong. And if you say it's right, fuck you. You're my enemy. And I'm not coming over to your side of the fence. And so the combination of reading that book and all these other things, I've always had a problem with racism anyway. I was raised with it. I was a white kid in an all-black school, so I was, I was getting beaten up for killing Martin Luther King. I got beaten up for putting people in slavery. I got beaten up because I had straight hair. I'm getting beat up all the time because I'm white, I'm white, I'm white, and I always hated racism because it kept me from having friends. I come from Washington, D.C., where back in the old days, most of D.C., a white guy couldn't walk through for fear of just getting his brains knocked out of his head by a brick or a rock or a stick or a fist. So I hate the idea that there's places in this country that I can't go because I'm hated for my skin. And, and I, I, it is, it's abhorrent to me that anyone could harbor such a low-minded, ridiculous attitude and stand up for it and throw a Bible up next to it and says, this says lynching this guy is okay. It blows my mind. The other thing that blows me away, that where you build the wall, is homophobia. And this thing came to me a while ago, which uh, made me think about homophobia quite a bit. It's usually not a topic I think about all that much. But I started getting phone calls from people who've known me a long time. And they were asking me, uh, not really asking, they were kind of somewhat accusing me. Henry, uh, you're not gay, are you? I'm like, uh, no. But immediately, the way they asked it told me, you know, told me everything about how, what they think about homosexuality. Okay, you're not gay, are you? Like, you know, you don't have AIDS, do you? You know, you don't have a fucking, like, you know, tumor coming out of your neck, do you? You know, you don't have, like, Ernest Borden I living in your ass, do you? <laughs> you know, you're not gay, are you? I'm like, no. You know? Oh. I go, uh, who told you I was? Oh, um... Some guy from a skate magazine? Oh, I see. So you get your information about me, who you've known about 12 years. You get it from some skateboarder guy. Uh huh. What else did you hear? Uh, that you're going to come out on MTV's Alternative Nation to Kennedy? <laughs> okay. The reply to that has two parts. A, if I was gay, there'd be no closet. I'd be taking out ads. Aging alternative icon wants dick and lots of it. B, I would not come out to a Republican, even on MTV. No way. But it made me think a bit about homophobia. And when you, when, uh, you see homophobia in men, it's just so hilarious. Because you guys know how you are. You women know how we are. We have one thing on the mind all the time. Yes, we'll talk about other topics, but there's one we are in one key, you know? Our, our E string is tuned to a certain key. And we can say, we can talk about cantaloupes, we can talk about sewer pipes, we can talk about the mail, we can talk about the Lakers, but at the bottom of all of it, boom. <laughs> now, what do men like to do with their dick? Park it somewhere warm, move it around, ejaculate, pass out. An orifice is an orifice is an orifice is an orifice. And, it, and a, you know, ejaculation is an ejaculation is an ejaculation. How dare any guy have a problem where another guy wants to put his dick? You fucking fag? You want to fuck some guy? You want to put your dick in a warm place, move it around, ejaculate, and pass out and wake up groggy, groping for an Anheuser-Busch Bush product? God, you're fucked up. The, the hypocrisy of that is so stupid because I am a cock-carrying male. I know what's on my mind 24-7. And I know the things I've said to get laid. I know the elaborate labyrinths of horseshit that have come out of my mouth <laughs> to get a pair of underwear to fall three and a half feet to the ground and to be kicked with gleeful abandon across into the corner. I've no, I, I, I remember the seven-hour soliloquies. 9,000 reasons why I am sensitive and safe to be around. Blah, 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 blah. And really what I was trying to say is, God damn it, take it off. Let, just let me see it, please. God. <laughs> yeah. 
So it just blows me away how one guy can say, me have good dick, you have bad dick. <laughs> Knowing how men are, they're just dogs. All men are dogs. We want to hump on something. Man, if you rub your dick against a tree, <laughs> <laughs> moving bus, <laughs> it doesn't matter. Hit it with a fucking hammer long and a... <laughs> you know, how dare any guy say, ooh, you're, you're fucked up. You're fucked up if you're trying to stick in a 12-year-old kid. And if the guy comes to you with a heart, on just go, no thanks. He'll go, okay, he'll go somewhere else. <laughs> Guys are used to going somewhere else with their dicks. We go somewhere else all the time with them. No, cool. I've noticed in men's rooms, a lot, I'm, I'm in a lot of men's rooms at the airport and stuff, uh, a lot of um, construction is put together so um, no men have to see each other's dicks. No, you never see one. Big, big fucking marble partitions between the urinals. More construction put into the partition than into the urinal itself. Major tonnage of rock or metal product to keep you from seeing a flaccid two-inch member expel urine. Whoa, can't do it because, like, you know, like I said, two, you know, two years ago when I got on stage here, if another, if a straight guy sees another dick, whoa, he's part fag already just from seeing it. Oh no, two percent of me wants to put that in my mouth. Ah! <laughs> How many straight guys in here have jerked off and tasted their own cum? It's too dark to see a hand count. I'm sure I'm all alone. Like, ooh, you're fucked up. Oh, I'm so fucked up. You're always hoping that she'll be tasting it and loving it. What's the fucking double standard? She's been fucking swallowing it for years. You can't, you can't take a teaspoon down and check it out? It belongs to you. To you, it's some kind of... Uh, obnoxious mixture and uh, hopefully for her it's a fucking nectar of the god <laughs> yeah watch the seats empty as men run to the men's room check it out <laughs> I figured it'd be fun to loosen some guys up in the men's room I came up with two, two uh, strategies in which to do this when you're at the urinal you are looking straight ahead at either the flusher or the mothball Usually reading the insignia on the flusher over and over. This is to concentrate on staring straight ahead. Because you do not, you want your peripheral vision to even go near, you don't even, any guy near you to think you are looking in his general direction. You do not want to see another male. Because you do not want to like, I'm checking you out, I'm checking you out. No! Sloan International Registered Inc. The Mothball. Seven times seven is 49. 12 times 12 is 144. Two times two is four. Times 10 is 40. Times three is 120. Times three is 300. And, you, know, you just do anything, math. You are only there to download urine. You are not there to look at another dick. And men will concentrate with utmost attention. They shake off, put it away. 180, right to the sink to wash their hand off from touching their own dick. I can never figure that out. It's yours. It's, what, what are you afraid of your own dick? <laughs> Doubtful. So, I came up with two ideas just to kind of like, you know, put a little chaos in the men's room. Leaking away, partitions up. When a man is looking straight or anyone's looking straight ahead, try not to look to the side. Of course, they're going to try and look to the side. The peripheral vision is very active at this point. So, you're leaking away. You don't have to be too crass. All you have to do is just go like, <laughs> basically, you're saying like, all right, man, cool. <laughs> the other one, a bit more bold, a bit more adventurous. I've never done either of these, but you go for it. Go for it. <laughs> when a man is about to shake off and finish urination, one shoulder will dip, come up again, and then the shiver <laughs> as they put it away. When you see the shoulder dip, you make your hand like that, reach around the divider, crotch level, spear his dick, shake him off. <laughs> reach back around, go back to leaking. Don't even look at him again. 
because, and maybe you might make a new friend. Men become friends in the strangest ways, don't they? Often can start with violence, you know, I'll kill, I'll fucking kick your ass, boom, boom, bang, bang, boom, boom, boom. 20 minutes later, buying each other shots, man, I fucking love you, man. <laughs> Wanted to tell you uh, this story uh, where I learned a, a lesson that you all learned when you were 12. I learned it when I was 35. Um, I'm always slow to the table with everything, as you can see. Can't get off talking about his dick. So anyway, yes, obviously I have problems. So um, I learned this. I learned this lesson last year, and uh, you know you might get a kick out of the hearing how I learned something 25 years late. Um, I, I'm a big fan of music, so I'm, a, I'm really into you know if I if there's a band I find out about a band I like, I buy their record and I write them a fan letter. I write them a letter. I find some address, either at the record label or them or their management, and I send them a fan letter and go, I, I think you guys are fucking cool, you know, right on, I can't wait to hear the next record, blah, 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 and I sign it, and every once in a while I get a letter back, like, yeah, dear Henry Rollins, in quotation marks, fuck you, okay? <laughs> Why would you, you, anyone would believe that Henry Rollins would write us a letter, okay, you, you really suck, man, for impersonating Henry Rollins, da, da, da. then I have to send him another letter, no, look, and I have to send him like a business card or something to prove that it's me, you know, so, you know, a picture of me, like, holding the record with a Polaroid. Because <laughs> I like being a fan of other bands. I like being a fan of writers. If there's a great writer who I like, I want to read everything they wrote. I want to read every biography about them. I'm like, fanboy. I want to know everything. And every once in a while, I meet some musician or someone I'm, I really admire. I drive them out of their mind. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Remember in 1941, okay, you had, uh, on your first tour of France on the morning of July the 15th, I think it was, you had poached eggs at breakfast. I have a tape of it. Um, and these guys are like, get away from me. Don't, don't talk to me anymore. Because I, I know all about them. You know, some fanboy, right? And um, I've, I've, had some really awesome fanboy experiences like in the last few months, man. Unbelievable fanboy experiences where it's one of a fucking spray half the Western world. I got, we got to go on tour with Ozzy Osbourne, this guy I really admire. And uh, he's one of the guys who raised me. Like when I heard Iron Man, you know, when I heard about a guy who gets rejected by the town, he goes, staggers off to the great magnetic field, turns into Iron Man, comes back and kills everybody. That was the way my 14-year-old mind could cope with rejection. Oh, you don't like me? Fuck you. Die. Die. So I realized Ozzy understood me better than my parents, and I always wanted to meet him after that, and I've been a rabid Ozzy and Sabbath fan all my life, so we got to tour with him. And he was really cool to us, man. He's really nice. And um, I got this opportunity on the second day of the tour. My road manager said, hey, uh, Rip Magazine or Raw Magazine, I forget which one. They said, they want you to interview Ozzy. I'm like, no way. And I said, how many days do I get? Because I figured, like, days one through five will be, like, Sabbath, spring 71 to, like, fall 71. You know, I already had the notes ready. They look like the yellow pages. <laughs> okay, those are my notes I've taken on the first album. I've, there's a lot of things I want to know. And so I said, well, how am I going to do this? And road manager said, okay, well, tomorrow night we're going to play. The third night is we have the club date. Ozzy's off. After tomorrow night's show, you're going to go with Ozzy and his family to their hotel, wake up in the morning, interview him, and then we're going to get you to the club show. Like, well, isn't that a lot of driving? And said, so he goes, well, w me and Ozzy's manager are going to figure it out. But if you want to do this, you got to tell me because i got to go get going on the business end. I said, if Ozzy's into it, put it through. I'd be honored to interview him. I Tons of stuff I'd like to ask him. So the next night, we're getting towards the afternoon. I go into the production office, and I go over to Sharon Osborne, you know, Ozzy's wife and manager. Like, hey, Sharon, um, how are we doing this thing tonight? How am I going to be with you guys and do all this? She goes, okay, here's, here's what we've worked out for you. Um, after the show's over, uh, you're going to come with us, you know, me and Ozzy and the family. We're going to go, and uh, we're flying to this island that we're staying on for all the Florida dates. It's called Amelia Island, and we got you a room where we're staying at the uh, Four Seasons Hotel. We're like, you know, the, the beds are like fucking football fields. I'm like, whoa, the Four Seasons. She goes, yes, we got you a suite there, and in the morning, you're going to interview Ozzy. And I said, yeah, but I have, to get to a, I have to get to a club date, you know, back in Florida. He says, there's a road that goes across the key to Florida. We've hired a limousine. The limo's gonna take you to the gig. I said, whoa, limo to, the, to a club gig? Cool. All right, that's pretty rock and roll. And, that, and I said, well, what airline goes at like one in the morning from Jacksonville to Amelia Island? Well, are we gonna get some funky red eye? 
She looks at me like I'm nuts. She goes, no, we're flying in our jet. I said, let me get this right. After the show, I'm going to fly in like Ozzy's private jet with Ozzy Osbourne. She said, yes. I was like, <laughs> fanboy in heaven. Sure enough, gig is over. I get my gym bag, get into the van with Ozzy and the family. The guy from the venue drives us to this little airport. Two pilots are waiting by this plane that has his logo on the side. I was like, wow, fuck. We get on this plane. She says, Henry, I'm going to take the family in the back so you two can hang out together. I was like, God, thanks a lot. And his assistant, uh, Tony, comes up and gives us each a Diet Pepsi and gives us a box of crackers and heads to the back of the plane. And the two pilots are like t totally uniform. They stick their heads out the cockpit. Are we ready to go to Amelia Island? And we're like, sure, man. And we take off, and Ozzy's looking towards the cockpit, and I have a seat opposite him looking towards the back of the plane, so I'm this far from Ozzy. And I sat there with a Diet Pepsi and a box of crackers, and I hung out with Ozzy and talked to a Black Sabbath for like an hour. Just me and him in his private jet. <laughs> you know, we were knee-deep in seed. <laughs> for me, for, like, for fanboy number one, man, I, was, I had thought I had just died. It was awesome. Um, about two weeks ago, when James Brown got his uh, star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame for some, you know, he's, he's like, he's one of my heroes. Him and Iggy Pop hold up the groaning stacks of records. They are my bookends of awesome front men. And lording over them, telling them what to do and making sure they keep their shit together is the first lady of soul, Aretha Franklin. Pick that up. I'm like, sorry, sorry, Aretha. You know, because they know that she's the boss, and so do I. So anyway... I get invited to James Brown's reception for his reception for getting the star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. So I'm watching him do a press conference. I'm like, oh my God, I'm staying in the same room with Butane James, the godfather of soul. I have all these records. He is such a huge inspiration to me. You know, as a musician, as an Afro-American, as a civil rights, you know, a guy in the civil rights movement, as a guy who gave, you know, Afro-Americans an identity through music as a guy who defined himself as a man who made up a genre of music. You don't meet many of these guys. He's up there with Duke Ellington. He's a serious fucking scientist. And I'm in the room with him and his hair is awesome and he's like doing the press thing and these guys are asking him all these questions. And the mayor comes and gives him an award and announces that January 10th is now James Brown Day. And he goes, whoa, well, thank you, sir. I'll have to come back here next year. Ha! You know, and... <laughs> Polygram gives him yet another platinum record for his greatest hissing. James, you've sold another million records. God bless you. We love you at Polygram, and you know, we'll keep on doing it. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ha! And he gives it away. Then the Olympic Committee gives him a, the Olympic Achievement Award. I think they've only given it to God, and they give one to him. You know, I'm sorry God edged you out to get the first one, but, uh, you know, he has top priority. Oh, that's all right. You know, ha. You know, he gives it to somebody, and then he holds up his daughter, and they all do photos of him. Casey Kasem, American Top 40 man. He comes with what I thought was his granddaughter. It's his wife. Okay, I looked it up. I'm into looking things up. He's 178 years old, and his, his wife is about 19. Bam, boom, bam. Hilarious. She comes like in a halter top with that like fake tan, like nine liters per side. And he's really old. And he's got those great teeth, the white teeth that come like that come before him. And when he smiles, his lips pull back to his ears. So he's like, <laughs> and he just looked insane because he's got Pamela Anderson with, with dark hair and like these teeth. And they're doing these photos. It's like amazing. And there's James like, Looking really good. Every hair is styled. Not his hair is styled. Every hair has an attendant. Every hair has an individual man who comes and styles it. Number 11044599. Oh. And that's why it took him 45 minutes to get to the press conference. The, the courtesy lady comes over, his, his assistant comes over, would you like to meet Mr. Brown? I went, well, sure, but, you know, he's busy. I'll just, you know, stand here and just kind of be a gog from a corner. She goes, well, okay. She comes back a minute later, uh, would you like to meet Mr. Brown now? I go, well, he's doing a press conference. You know, I'm not going to get in his way. I am whisked into the press conference. I'm walked on stage. James sees me coming, takes a jacket off the stool next to him. I sat down, and she says, Mr. Brown, this is Henry Rollins. And he goes, how you doing? And I went, how do you do, Mr. Brown? He shakes my hand like, <laughs> I was like, whoa. And the press goes, whoa. <laughs> starts taking all these pictures, and I realize through my, my haze, my fanboy haze, that 
I'm doing a photo session with James Brown in front of much media. I was like, no way. <laughs> I'm hoping he's not like, what's behind me? What, huh, huh? what did you say? I'm hoping I'm not going to get the back of his head. I'm like, please look at the camera with me. This is, means a lot to me. <laughs> and so a guy from this English TV show called The Big Breakfast leans his mic over and goes, um, hey, Henry, uh, what impact has Mr. Brown had on you? And I said, well, you know, a, a huge impact. You know, uh, I've been listening to him since I was really young. And there's one thing he said in one of his songs that I live by, which is if you don't work, you don't eat. And I live by that. I think that's really cool. You know, I think, you know, band should have that ethic that you go play every night just to get, just to eat. And then your, your music will be, it will be intense. He looks at me, he goes, I did say that, and hugs me. I'm like... Whoa! And then the guy says, um, well, what musical impact has he had on you? I said, well, you know, he's, he's James Brown. I mean, come on. It's like getting hit by a Buick, you know? And uh, I said, Super Bad should be like the American National Anthem. And his live album, Live of the Apollo Volume 3, Revolution of the Mind, is the greatest live album ever recorded in the history of mankind. He goes, this man knows what he's talking about, and hugs me again. I'm like, this is so cool. And then, um, you know, he had to go away and do other interviews. And um, Danny Ray, the guy who's been introducing him and taking his cape off for like the last 40 years, he was standing over there. I recognize him immediately. He has like that, that same face. And he gives me a wink, you know, and I walk over there. I go, how do you do? He goes, you know that album that you were talking about? I mean, that, you know the guy? Ladies and gentlemen, you're about to see the eighth wonder of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, the man who bought you out of sight. Dang, Papa's got a brand new bag. Ladies and gentlemen, the man is internationally known as Soul Brother Number One. He's known as Soul Brother Number One in South Africa. He's known as Soul Brother Number One in Michigan. Ladies and gentlemen, he's internationally known as Soul Brother Number One. Ladies and gentlemen, James Brown. James Brown. That guy. <laughs> he's standing over there. He gives me the wink. I get, shake his hand. I go, how do you do, sir? He goes, you know that album that you were talking about during the press conference? I'm like, wow, he even sounds like the guy. I went, yeah. I narrated that album. I went, narrated? That just sounded so weird. I, I went, yes, I know, sir, and you were great. On that album, he reintroduces James Brown like three times through the thing as if you forgot who was on stage. <laughs> like uh, by the third side of the record, ladies and gentlemen, James Brown. And people are like already in a frenzy anyway. You know, it was, just a, it was just an amazing day. Then he went out on stage and played two songs with this uh, uh, Latino band, and he had his gospel backup singer, Chicks, doing uh, Sex Machine with him. And when he said to the crowd, you know, I want to get into it, which means I'm about to start up Sex Machine. Can I count it off? I'm standing in the DJ booth, screaming at the top of my lungs, count it off! There's so many times I wanted to be the guy who said, count it off! Just like on the Sam Cooke, you know, when Sam Cooke does uh, Chain Gang, and the guy goes, don't you know? That's the sound, you know, that, I, I, that should be me. <laughs> We're like, that's your only thing that night? You're like, ah, ah. you're getting ready, get the bow tie ready to go, like, ah. well, don't you know? <laughs> Just walk off. <laughs> Man, I, I would have, I'd, I'd give both my balls to have been Bobby Bird. That's the guy who sings with James all through, on the, in, through the 70s, like, get up, get on up. That guy, that's Bobby Bird. How cool would it be to be standing next to James, like, Get into it! Get into it! And just stand next to him and like do that every night. Fuck! To be to be flavor flave to his Chuck D. <laughs> anyway, I watched him do these songs. I met the man. I walked three miles home from this place without even feeling it. I think I levitated home. I, I probably jaywalked every red light. I was just like, this hand touched James Brown's hand. That was so fucking cool. And I will live with that memory for like the rest of my life. And I know that sounds really gushy, like, oh my God, I touched Bobby Sherman's dick. Oh my God, I can't believe it! And I've never, no one has ever had that effect on me. But like when I met James Brown, I was like, this is pretty fucking awesome. You know, I was like, yes, this I will remember. And it was, uh, I don't know, it was my, uh, my fanboy story. I wanted to um, read you uh, these four short pages, and I, I'm very loath to read stuff, because you can read. Why should I read to you? That's why I don't like to stand there like, that, like some stupid standing target. Oh, dark night. <laughs> oh, take me into your bitter womb. Oh, let me suckle at your fetid bosom. 
Oh, blackness, take me in. Oh, evil woman of the dark. You know, I, don't, I can't do that shit. So I don't read much, but I got to read this shit to you, and I'll explain why. Um, I yell and scream for a living. So I've always uh, sought a real throat doctor who could give me some tips on how to keep yelling and screaming for a long time. So I would go to throat doctors here and there, and they make you bring in your record so they can hear what you do. And I would go into, like, you know, throat doctor man, and I'd go, okay, put on the tape. Fucking kill it! He would go, get out of my office. <laughs> get out of my office, you fucking psychopath asshole. You're not a singer. You're just a fucking child. I never want to see you again. Okay? So... I asked management, can you please find me someone who can really take care of this because, man, I'm going to have to really take care of my throat for the long run. So we found a guy in Beverly Hills. His name is Joseph Sugarman. He is rock throat man. He does Ozzy. He does the members of KISS. He does the guy in White Snake. Um, you know, so he understands people who yell and scream. So I uh, went there. His brother younger brother is Danny Sugarman, the guy who co-wrote No One Here Gets That Alive, you know, the, the kid who lived, hung out with Jim Morrison and did a lot of drugs. Um, that's his younger brother. And so I go to this throat doctor for a routine checkup. Let's look at Henry's throat and, and see what's going on. Bring my, my tape with me. I go into the front office, and usually when I go into a front office of any doctor's office, the lady goes like, I have, I have no cash under the drawer, please. And the three women who work at the front of Dr. Sugarman's, like these three really friendly, pretty, rock-oriented women. I walk in, they all go like, cool. <laughs> all right, the doctor's totally ready to see you now. You can just like totally walk in. <laughs> Excellent. You're so, so cool that you're going to be a patient here. So I, I was like, all right, you know, and I walk through, and his hallway is covered with gold and platinum records, all these bands, like, you know, thank you, Dr. Sugarman, bam, platinum record, bam, four platinum CD set from White Snake, you know, slide it in, on there. All these are really famous people, as, as well as people like Al Jarreau, all these people have their platinum records on the wall. I'm like, damn, this dude sees a lot of famous motherfuckers. So I sit in this little, I'm told to sit in this little room. Doctor comes in. He actually has the leather strap around his head with like that silver dollar mirror thing. I'm like, get the fuck out of here with that thing. What's up, Marcus Welby? You know? And he comes in, he goes, Henry, how are you? I'm Joseph Sugarman. He's totally straight. I'm like, hello, sir, how are you? Well, Henry, well, I'll put in your tape. I'll put in the tape. He goes, Well, I don't think Pavarotti has any uh, competition here, but um, let's see what we can do for you. Open up. And he looks down my throat. He's a nice guy. You know, he's just very serious, you know. Looking down my throat, he goes, okay, um, Henry, I've got to ask you a few questions because uh, it's, I have to know about uh, what you do, you know, with your throat so I can treat you. So um, don't be uh, offended by any of these questions. I ask these to everybody who comes in. I would ask these to a nun if she came in. So please bear with me. I'm like, yeah, man, shoot, whatever. Okay, um, how many cigarettes a week do you smoke, do you think? How many packs a day or a week? I, I don't smoke. He's like, okay. Um, what's your alcohol intake Does, uh, on average, like per week? How, do, you, do you get drunk on the weekends? Do you drink regularly? I go, no, I don't drink alcohol. He went, okay. <laughs> um, okay, remember I said I would ask this question to anybody. I am not a cop, okay? I am your doctor. Anything you say to me, is confidential. So I need to know, though, in order to treat you, because if I give you some kind of treatment that clashes, uh, I c you could die. I need to know what kind of drugs you do and how much you do them and when you do them. I'm like, I, I, you mean like heroin and cocaine? He goes, yes, all, all of the bad stuff. I go, I, I don't do them. He goes, okay, Henry, remember, I, I'm not a cop. I mean, I, I care for your well-being, but I don't care. I mean, you know who my brother is, right? You've seen the people on my wall. I mean, they've snorted up like third world countries up their nose. I mean, you've seen, you, you know the legends of these people. I, I went, yeah, I, I don't do any drugs. He goes, um, Henry, if I put you on some kind of medication and you say you're doing cocaine, you could have a heart attack. 
so you really need to tell me. I go, I'm really telling you the truth, doc, because I really don't care what you think of me. If I was doing drugs, I would tell you so you would not kill me with some medication. I understand what happens when drugs collide. I don't want to die like that, so I'm telling you the truth. He went, okay, Henry, I must tell you, I have only seen one throat in worse condition than yours. I go, yeah, who's that? He said, Stevie Nicks. He said, Henry, I gotta be truthful with you. you. You look like you chain smoke, drink whiskey, and do coke every day. I go, that bad? He goes, Come into the next room. Go into the next room. He opens my mouth up, sticks a tube down there that has a camera, like filament camera on the end. He goes, I'm going to video your throat. What I want you to do is pull your tongue out with this cloth. He gives me a little, you know, those little gauze things. Pull out my tongue, and he says, I want you to hold a high note. I want you to go ee, and that'll make your vocal cords close up so we can see actual movement of your vocal cords. I'm like, fine. Sticks the thing down. He goes, okay, give me the high note. I'll go ee. He goes, okay, great. Pulls the thing out, puts the video you know, turns the monitor on, rewinds the video. He goes, I'm gonna show you some healthy vocal cords and I'm gonna show you yours because I want you to see what real vocal cords look like. I go, okay. <laughs> so he flashes a, a set of vocal cords. This is a normal set of vocal cords. They are two blue-white tendons that form an A-frame across your throat like this. And they go this way, not this way. They are like three-eighths of an inch long, which I found, they're really tiny. They fit on a dime. And um, they're blue-white, and they look like they are, like I guess, tendons. They're cords. And he goes, okay, now here's a set, and there's the person holding the high note. You know, they go together. He goes, here's another set, and they look the same. He goes, okay, Henry, here's yours. Two purple, red, bulbous, about to explode veins with divots in them and white dots. <laughs> Already touching. He goes, now watch you hold the high note. They just kind of go, <laughs> like, like two worms being smashed together. And I went, oh man. He goes, Henry, I don't even know how you're talking to me right now. I look at that and it hurts me just to see it. Do you see why I asked you? I said, yeah, man, I, I see. But you know, I, I, I tell you, man, I don't do any of that stuff. And uh, he said, okay, well, you know, um, I think it could be some acid reflux. You know, you're coughing up acid at night. I want you to cut down your caffeine, cut down on any hot food, you know, basically cut down on fun, you know. <laughs> and I'm going to put you on a prescription of some Prelozic to get, reduce the stomach acid in your stomach, and I want you to take it, run the prescription out, call me up, and come back in for another checkup, and let's see if this made any progress. This might be the problem. I said, okay, cool. He says, I want you to go down the hall and go in and see Vivian, who's our head secretary. You have forms to fill out and I'll be in in a few minutes. I said, fine. So I go into this room, and um, there's a woman sitting behind the desk. I go, excuse me, ma'am. I'm a very polite guy. Excuse me, ma'am. Um, my name is Henry. I'm supposed to fill out something. She goes, yes. And she comes around her desk. She comes up to me with a clipboard and a big pen. She goes, okay, here, take the pen. Okay, do you see at the bottom of the clipboard here, it says signature? I went, yeah. Okay, I want you to sign your name there. I went, okay. <laughs> and underneath it, it says SS. I went, yeah. She goes, that's social security. That's a number. Do you know your social security number? I went, yeah, since I was in third grade, you know, whatever. I said, are you talking to me like this because I'm a guy in a rock band and I have tattoos, therefore you assume I'm stupid? She went, yes. Now take the pen and sit down, and I want you to... I immediately knew that me and this lady were going to be buddies for life. I love this kind of humor. I love the balls of this woman totally dissing me immediately upon contact. I thought she was awesome. I went, okay, so I'm an idiot. She's like, were you talking, dear? I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> oh, why can't I meet a woman about 30 years younger than you? Fuck, we'd be famous, you know? <laughs> so I fill out the thing, and I grab a paper clip, aim it, goes into her hair. She's like, oh, you're very funny. Here's a little uh, reminder for you. Take this posted on your forehead, and immediately an office supply fight starts. You know, stuff is going across the desk. We're ducking. Paper clips are flying. I'm shooting staples at her. I mean, like, full-on World War office, you know, thing. It starts. A few minutes later, the doctor comes in. We got, like, you know, like, liquid paper mustaches on each other. You know, like, El Marco eyebrows, like, pentagrams on each other's heads. It lasts on each other with paper clip chains. We're just going off. And he comes and we're like, 
What? <laughs> he scotch taped my hand to the desk. <laughs> Are you two okay? Yeah, you know, yeah, we're fine, doc. We're, we're cool. We'll be right out. Looks at us like, leaves. And I fill out the form. I said, I'll be seeing you later. She goes, yeah, in your dreams. <laughs> and I leave. And the doc is waiting in the hallway. Goes, what was all that about? Uh, you know, come on, I don't know. And so he's walking me to the exit. And he goes, okay, I want you to go downstairs. Like, you need to get this prescription. I really want you to get this handle. I go, yes, sir, man, I'll do it. And I'm leaving. And I look up over the exit door. And there is a multi-platinum disc set awarded to Dr. Sugarman from Michael Bolton. And I went, doctor, no. You treat him? He's like, yes, are you familiar with his work? I went, he's the Antichrist. <laughs> Chop his head off. Kill him. While under sedation, doctor, do us all a favor. Henry, now you've heard that thing if you have nothing nice to say. <laughs> He's a very nice guy, Henry. I'm like, oh, I'm sure he is. I'm sure Hitler was nice to his pets too, but you know, some people just gotta go. <laughs> and he said, well, I think it's time for you to go. And okay. So I left, came back a few weeks later, did the checkup, went out on the road. What started? was an invasion of his privacy and sanity with bogus faxes that came from my power book from all over America. I set up a totally fictitious scenario about his office. I made up this whole world in my imagination and started faxing him from that reality. Here it goes. The women at the front desk are three belligerent people who hate the patients and who goad them and bait them when they call. The doctor thinks his patients are all idiots and is merely to treat them to get money. He does not care about them other than they're stupid and they have throats and they have too much money. Vivian has a fatal attraction thing with me. <laughs> and I've never told the doc about this thing, I just went for these faxes. All of these faxes I'm about to read to you are come, I'll read you the first one, two from the middle of the siege, and the last one I sent. And they all happened, can you please stop snapping that thing, you're really ruining my concentration, you've had enough photos, thank you. And I will read you these, and you'll like them. This is the first one he ever got, and I CC'd it to another doctor another bogus, you know, a bogus doctor. So if he ever tried to destroy this, it was backed up somewhere else. So if he ever tried to take me out or kill me or something, stand in front of me in front of the metal detector and take like all day, slowly killing me, the file, the document lives on. It is CC'd to Dr. Benjamin L. Knapp, Department Head of Divergent Behavior Studies, Frozen Bridge Gap, North Dakota. <laughs> Dear doctor, my main concern in faxing is, of course, about the uproar that Vivian's intense behavior is causing in your humble place of practice. I know you've gone over it with her time and time again that I will be back and that staging a hunger strike isn't going to bring me back any quicker to the West Coast. I'm sorry to hear that she put her fist through a good number of the platinum discs that grace the walls of your offices. I heard that the entire crew at the front desk had to broadside her and restrain her before they could give her the injection. What can I say? I don't know why I have this effect on women, well, on just Vivian, really, but I don't want the fact that she set up a candlelight vigil in the waiting room to reflect badly upon me. For I, as well as you, sir, am a professional, and I'm used to seeing this. And, sir, as you probably know all too well, Michael Bolton has a following of strange women from the Midwest who get crazed on Dexatron and stage all-night Tupperware parties in his honor. <laughs> These bolt heads, as they call themselves, are very extreme and dangerous when in groups of 300 or more. It is said that when they really get going, their momentum is virtually unstoppable. I'm gonna let you take it from here, sir. There's only so much I can do without litigation. And no one wants that, now do they? Cordially, but watch it. Here's a little follow-up a few weeks later. Dear doctor, thank you for faxing me from your vacation. Your story about sticking your arm down Ozzy Osbourne's throat was great. I was amazed to hear that he was carrying that beer bottle around in there for three years. <laughs> well, sir, I've been doing all the throat exercises that you advised. 
The regimen of bourbon and cigarettes is hard, but I'm sticking with it. <laughs> I must admit that when I yell at the top of my lungs in everyday conversation, as you advised, it is a bit off-putting to people, but you're the doctor and you know what's best, right? <laughs> and I can remember you clearly telling me, Henry, that pain will give your voice character. <laughs> well, sir, it hurts like hell, but I'm keeping it up. This came a while later. Dear doctor, I'm sorry to bother you with this fax, but every time I call your office, the woman answering the phone just says, what the hell do you want? And when I ask for you, she says, he's busy with some idiot with dyed hair, stupid tattoos, too much money, and no talent, just like you, Pavarotti. <laughs> and before I can tell her that I do not have a single dyed hair on my head and that my savings are considerably less than ever since becoming a patient at your alleged place of practice, she starts playing Mary Had a Little Lamb on the phone's keypad until I hang up. So until I come back in for a checkup, this short but important fact will have to do. What concerns me at this moment is not Vivian's repeated and vulgar attacks on me in public places. I have since hired a bodyguard to protect me from her random psychotic episodes. <laughs> it's costly, but what price is peace of mind? No matter, no sir, the main thrust of this particular missive is to remind you again that you can change the very course of contemporary music right there in your office. You can make a significant change for the better. And after the litigation and possible but short incarceration is over with, your practice will be stronger and more profitable than ever. I see the plan running like this. You call in Bolton for a routine checkup <laughs> and tell him that you see a small spot on one of those golden vocal cords of his from a slide from a previous visit. You put him under after telling him you're going in for a closer look. It's then that you happen to miss with your scalpel and accidentally slice his vocal cords cleanly, thus rendering him silent. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. I know you're going to say what you always say when I recommend such a stunt. Henry, he's money in the bank, just like all you overpaid idiots. Bolton is my retirement. He's the big cojona. But just think of what you'll be doing for mankind, sir. Never mind the wrath of the bolt heads. Sure, you'll have to do a Salomon Rushdie for a few years, but it'll be worth it. You'll get so many new patients who will align themselves with you just out of respect. And I know that I single him out of, out of all your clients, and I do remember your suggestion last time I was there. Henry, why don't you pick on the moron from Whitesnake? He's tried to stiff me twice. <laughs> no, sir, it's Bolton. Please, doctor, consider this one more time. And sir, please don't let Vivian see this. Any communique from me tends to make her upset and violent. <laughs> and this is the first time old Vivian actually got her own fax. This is the last one that got sent a little while ago. Dear Vivian, it's been so long since I've heard from you, besides the heavy breathing calls at three in the morning. <laughs> hey, I don't mind. It's just good to know that you're out there. I've been living in New York City, a place you know all too well, no doubt, judging from the responses I get from the local chapter of the Hells Angels on 3rd Street when I mention your name. <laughs> Crazy Vivian, they yell out, pounding their chests and randomly attacking passers-by. <laughs> a tribute, you understand. You have no idea how many times I've tried to get through to you at the office. The babes at the front desk are just flat-out abusive. It's a wonder that you get any business at all with the way they act. I call and ask for you, and either I'm told, hang on, Pavarotti, and I'm put on hold until I hang up, or the gal plays the opening notes of satisfaction on the, key, on the phone's keypad until I hang up. I can only hope that this fax gets through to you. I scan the newspapers looking for the headline about the Bolt Man losing his voice. You know the plan, Operation DeBolto, <laughs> that you and I have been working on over the last year. I never see anything about him having an accident while under sedation. You're not wimping out on me now, are you? I try and get this through to the good Dr. Sugarman, but he just brushes me off with lines like, stop faxing me unless your throat hurts, you idiot. So I guess it's you who will have to change the course of contemporary music. I know it's a heavy load to bear, to be the one to silence forever the mighty Michael Bolton, but don't think for a minute that you're unable to do it. I've seen you do some pretty amazing things in my time. Like the time you opened an entire case of Corona beer with your teeth and drank them all in under five minutes time. 
or the time you pushed over all the motorcycles in front, in front of the Thunder Road Cafe and stood with your arms crossed waiting for the Roners to come out and the way they ran away in terror. <laughs> Images like these don't fade from the memory all that quickly, my dear. Hey, you might not have asked to be a living legend, but destiny has handed this to you, so deal with it. And another thing, I called the good doctor the other day because my throat was giving me trouble. You wouldn't believe the treatment he put me on. Is it normal for him to prescribe that patients drink one quart of white vinegar an hour for three days? <laughs> I'm on the 10th quart and it's murder. Remember the tattoo I was getting of you? It came out looking really cool. I got thrown out of a restaurant for showing it off the other day because it's in one of those places. Three Hell's Angels have similar ones, but they aren't as good as mine. I logged on to your fan club website, and there's this picture of you smoking a filterless Lucky Strike. I thought you said you stopped smoking those when you got out of San Quentin. Well, just goes to show how mysterious women can be. I've known you so many years, yet there's so much more to find out. Well, I've got to go, so don't get in any fistfights in the office. And stop telling patients, hey, I heard your record and it sucks. Now get out of here. It's bad for business, Henry. <laughs> this quick story, some great detailed uh, information about some sex I had with a famous statuesque American blonde icon. I think that it's pretty lame to uh, kiss and tell. I did a project with Dennis Rodman a few weeks ago for MTV. And we lifted weights and we talked and it was really, really great. He was really interesting. He was a man of sparkling wit and humor. <laughs> After that, MTV called me up and said, hey, man, we need you to do a wraparound. We need you to talk about it. now that you met him. What do you think? I said, oh, I get a rebuttal? <laughs> bring it on. So they bring the camera to me and they say, so what did you think about Dennis Rodman? I want the truth or something that's ready for MTV. Uh, we'll take the MTV version. I thought so. I thought Dennis Rodman was really interesting, a fascinating, multifaceted man who was really, uh, really wonderful and really warm and really nice to a stranger like me who really appreciates his athletic prowess. I thought he was a really great guy. I had a wonderful afternoon talking with him. Now what do you want to know? Do you think that Dennis Rodman is a good role model for young people? I went, let's see. A guy who probably got an extra $100,000 on his autobiography advance for giving the I Fucked Madonna chapter. A guy who took intimate details of himself and a woman and printed them when the woman thought she was in an intimate situation and she could let her guard down and come out and be herself. It gets printed word for word in a tell-all that gets read by millions of people. That's not anyone who remotely who I would want my kid to grow up like. That is not the mark of a real man. That's fucking weak, okay? And that's what I said in not so many words. And I said, and Mr. Robin can deposit that in any orifice he so chooses. And uh, I said, but on the other hand, I think he's a tremendous athlete, and I respect his, you know, his athleticism because the guy's awesome on the, on the court. I just don't agree with that kind of conduct. Now, here I go to give you intimate details about me and having sex with this blonde. Here we go. <laughs> um, I was at this party several months ago uh, in New York. I don't, I'm not the partying kind of guy. You can tell. Hey, man, I like to get down. You can tell. I like to shake it, sometimes all night long. <laughs> Guess you can kind of tell. That's the kind of guy I am. <laughs> I was at this party because our drummer has a solo band called Hand Job. Yeah, I know, a little retarded for such an articulate young man, but um, it's a percussion unit, so it's Hand Job. So anyway, Sim is uh, out there playing with Hand Job, and he said, hey man, come down to the gig and check us out. I said, okay. So I went down to check out Hand Job, who were quite good. And while I'm checking it out, a guy from Electra Records comes up to me and says, hey, um, we're doing a tribute to One Hit Wonder Bands. And um, we want to know if you guys want to cover Funky Town by Lip Sync. And I went, 
no. <laughs> and he said, what's the matter? You don't like the song? I go, no, 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 no. I love the song. Is this it? I like the song so much, I wouldn't want to torture and maim it with what we would do to it. He goes, what, you guys don't think you could play it? I went, oh, <laughs> my guys can play any song in the known universe in five minutes' time. No, the only weak link in the band is the singer. He goes, well, that's you. I go, yes, I know. He sucks. <laughs> and he goes, oh, come on, you could do it. I go, yeah, you really want to hear four and a half minutes of, will you take me to Funky Town? I go, you want to hear that? And I said, I don't. And I'm sure a lot of other people wouldn't. So I politely decline. And he says, well, okay, how about you do the vocals with RuPaul? And I went, okay, let me give that absolutely no thought whatsoever. Okay. We love that guy. He practices in the same building we do. We've known Ru for four years. He's like the coolest man. He's a super nice guy. And uh, one day he came into our practice room and just uh, knocked on the door and came in and went, hello. And we're like, hello. He went, um, I'm just a fan. I wanted to say hi. We're like, okay, hello. We're standing there looking at him like, and? He went, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't introduce myself. I'm RuPaul. We threw the instruments down, tackled him, and made him sit and hang out with us on our couch for like the next three hours. He just hung out with him all day. He's the coolest guy. And so I said, vocals with RuPaul, Rollins Band and RuPaul doing Funky Town. We are so in there. We are in. Book it. Tell Ru to come down to band practice. We're in the same room arguing about the same shit for the second year. Let's do it. And so Ru comes over the next day. We go, okay, let's do this. And I said, okay, here's my idea of it. We have Melvin, our bass player, and Teo, our sound man, produce. Because like, you guys can produce. You know, Melvin, you're like a ranger man. Teo, you're going to be sound man. And like, you know, Melvin, you can do all the samples and stuff in case we need it. And I do not want Electra type suggesting anything. This is our project. We'll do it on our terms. I don't even want to hear their opinion. So I want to keep it in house. Can you guys handle this? Melvin, can you produce and play? He goes, I can do it. I said, great. You guys are hired to be the producers. Days later, we go to the studio. The boys cut the track. And you can imagine what it's going to sound like vocally. One guy's going to say, will you take me too? And the other guy's going to say, funky town. So we are called up. Me and Rue are called. Okay, guys, come on in. Do your vocals. So Rue does the entire song. They want us both to do the entire song three times so they can mix and match and cut together any vocal pattern they want without calling us back and to come in every day. So Rue, sing the song. You're going to do it three times. Do any kind of vocal you want. We can use it later in the mix. I said, and he said, fine. Went in there, sang it three times, three different ways. Amazing each time, one take each, perfect. Boom, boom, boom. Knocked it out in 30 minutes. It was amazing. Two and a half hours later, I limp through like the second take. I am so bad in the studio. Ah, blood comes out, I'm no good. So I get through all three versions after like a day and a half or something and I'm, I go skulking towards the door. Henry, where are you going? I'm going back to the hovel because I'm done singing. I hate the studio because it reinforces the fact that I suck. Like live, you could just go wow and just kick it and it's all mixed in with so many DB of everything else. Everyone goes like, you're awesome. In the studio, you go like, Oh, God, get some talent, please. Here, take some of mine. Like, here's a drop of talent. It's about a drop more than what you have. So I don't like the studio because it makes me face the other reality that, um, you know, Sam Cooke, I am not. So anyway, um, I limp through these vocals, and I'm trying to get out. And he goes, no, 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 you're coming back. And you're, you're, you've only started to do vocals. I go, oh, come on, what do you mean? He goes, you and Rue are going to go in there, and you're going to improv off each other, and you're going to go nuts. Because the only reason anyone's going to ever want to listen to this track, I mean, think about it. When they see Rollins Band and RuPaul, are they going to want a straight version of this song? No. They're going to want, like, RuPaul being the six-foot-five statuesque blonde and you being whatever it is that you are. <laughs> and you got to get down. you got to slime on each other. you got to get crazy. you got to get naked. you got to go to Funky Town. Otherwise, this thing is just four and a half minutes of da na 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 And I went, you're right. But... I don't know what to do. I don't have any idea. And then Rue goes, I have an idea. Grabs a piece of notebook paper, legal pad, starts writing down all this stuff. To this day, I still have the piece of paper. He goes, okay, I've got it. We're going to take a motorcycle to Funky Town. You're going to drive, Henry. I will ride him back. Before we get on the motorcycle, you're going to ask me if I have these clothes items. And I'm looking at it. Pussycat wig, hot pants, high heel sneakers. And then after we get to Funky Town, you're going to ask me this list of cities, how funky they are. And I'm going to tell you how funky they are. And the rest will just improvise. I went, fine, at least he has an idea. 
the two of us get into this vocal booth that holds like one person. We're squeezed in there, like just up, just up, bunched up against each other. I'm like, what, five, two or something? He's like <laughs> seven, eight. We put the mic in between it, so he has to bend down. I have to jump up to get a vocal. I'm holding my piece of paper, headphones on, very uptight about singing with someone who can sing. I'm, I'm like, okay, uh, I, I suck. And I'm getting all uptight. My anus is like, <laughs> and I go, oh, okay, let, let's do it. And the electric guys are sitting on the couch like, cool, man, all right. And they roll the track, and RuPaul is like born loose. The guy is just, just down with the program from the get-go. Tape starts rolling. He just goes off. Yo, Henry! I'm like, yeah, Ru, I'm ready to go. I was like, okay. Oh, yeah, all right. Um, and whenever I get nervous, uh, my voice goes to the lower register, and I start talking like I'm auditioning for Dragnet. I go, right. Hello, I'm G. Gordon Liddy. I go, uh, do you have your pussycat wig on? Mm, I got it cocked up on my head. Right. Uh, how about your hot pants? Sizzling, baby. Whoa. Um, how about the high-heeled sneakers? Mm-hmm. Right. Well, let's get on the motorcycle, and um, using our safety helmets, let's go to Funky Town. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Can I wrap my arms around you? The road is really rough. Oh, uh, go ahead, for safety's sake. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Ooh, Hank, you got some big muscles. Oh, thank you. I try and work out and use a high-protein uh, diet, you know, eat right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, by the way, Rue, uh, you've been all around the world. Mm -hmm. You've been all over the America. Oh, yes. What's the funkiest city you've ever been to? Mm, I don't know. Well, what about New York? Oh, child, stop. What about Miami? Ooh, funky. Well, what about uh, Atlanta? Oh, child, don't you start. Oh, what about Detroit? Ooh, Rock City. And then we, we, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we go on, we do some other vocals. He said, funky. And I went, funky. And we both went, funky town. And uh, we get to the end, and I was like, okay, there you go. So, you know, he put his arms around me. That was pretty risque, you know. Cross-dresser putting his arms around a straight guy. Ooh, pushing it, you know. On a motorcycle. Whoa. The electric guys are like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and on the edge. Melvin and Taylor are looking at me with utter contempt. Is that all you can do? Oh, Henry, come on. Are you that uptight? I'm like, no, come on, that was really cool. Henry, I'm like, all right, we'll try it again. And, you know, that was like R. I, I said, okay, I guess we should push towards NC-17, right? Start the track up again. Yo, Henry, yeah, Rue, I'm ready to go. Okay, get on the motorcycle. Now I initiate the contact. Well, Rue, it's a bumpy road. Why don't you wrap your arms around me? Oh, okay. Ooh, you got some big muscles. You like that? Oh, yes, I do very much. <laughs> I take another plunge into icy water. Rue, you know, we can do things in Funky Town that are illegal or immoral in about 48 states. Honey, don't make promises your ass can't keep. Mm. And I was like, wow, whoa, oh, oh, boy. So we get to Funky Town, what cities are funky, you know, we do all that, and then we get to the end, and I go, I look out the glass, like, how's that? The electric guys are like, oh, beat red, like, oh, wow, caliente in here. And I look at Melvin and Tay, and they're just looking at me like, They're so bored of me. They said, Henry, come on, don't waste our time. Don't waste RuPaul's time. Would you fucking just loosen up and just get down? I, I, and then I, I realized I'm uptight. I have no reason to be uptight. What's the matter? Afraid of a six foot five naked blonde man who dresses like a chick? Ooh, what's the matter? Afraid of your, uh, your heterosexuality? You're afraid, are you not confident in your heterosexuality? You can't like, you know, have sex, you know, go to funky town with some guy in a song? Ooh, what is, does it, are people gonna think you're not the macho shithead that they all love you for? You know, all these things are challenging me, and I'm like, damn, man, no, I am secure inside my sexuality, and I don't have a problem with anybody else's sexuality, and I am being an uptight asshole, and I'm wasting everybody else's time. Roll that fucking tape. Let's do this. Go to the top of the tape. Yo, Henry, yeah, I'm ready to go. Oh, yeah, you got those hot pants on that I've been thinking about? Yes, baby. And we get on the motorcycle. You better put your fucking arms around me, Rue. This road is really rough. He goes, oh, Henry, you have some big muscles. I go, Rue, take your right hand, reach around, and feel this one. And he goes, oh, my God. I went, yeah. 
We get to Funky Town. I book a cheap hotel room. I drag him upstairs. I burst the door down. I t- rip his clothes off. I throw him in the shower. I scrub him down. I tear him out of the shower, still dripping. Throw him on the bed. Go, Rue, grab the bedposts. Here I come. And for the next three and a half minutes, we went for the loudest, sweatiest, most animalistic coital rock session you have ever heard in your entire life. Two men in a room for the last 30 minutes, sweating on each other, steaming up the glass, man funk flying, two bodies rubbing on each other, humping this, the air and the mic stand, like, ah, 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 two men screaming at the top of their lungs, going, go daddy, go, yeah, ha, ah. and I'm imagining I am fucking this large ebony man in a cheap hotel room, and I'm going for it with everything that I'm worth, and he's going, ah, 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 and we, we forgot about what cities are funky we forgot about the funky 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 towns we went all the way the track ends we kept on humping for at least 12 seconds after the song is over and we're like ah, 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 ah. and I look up at Rue and he looks down at me and I said was that good for you and he went Yes, baby. (laughs) And we embrace, knowing we are now buddies for life. We have bonded. Men become friends in the strangest ways. I clear off the now steaming glass and look through. The electric guys have left. Melvin and Teo are sprawled out over their chairs, spinning. (laughs) Spent. Ah. It was awesome. The track is sitting in the can. There's complications with the album, but we're going to put it out at some point. It's really cool. (laughs) So the next time anyone ever mentions America's greatest, most awesome blonde bombshell, who is RuPaul, you can always remember, yep, Henry had him. Twenty floors over Times Square, and he said it was awesome. Thank you very much for having me. Good night. Thanks. <laughs>